Hello everybody, how are you doing today? Is everyone doing okay? Is everyone doing good? Hope everybody is having a wonderful morning and everything. And I hope everyone enjoyed the uh, previous stream. Hello, Mustache Samurai. I hope you're doing all right today. All right, so today we will be playing Suzerain, as you very well know. Um, this is a political narrative thriller, as I like to say, um, by Torpor Games, and thank you Torpor Games for letting me stream on your channel. Um, I played the demo for this game about, well, I say it was a few months ago. Um, I really was intrigued by it. I originally wasn't going to play it on my channel, but I decided to because of uh, I like politics, basically. But yeah, I've enjoyed the content. So I did a poll on this here recently and I decided uh, we had the top two choices so later on today I'm gonna release on my channel the authoritarian uh, authoritarian right playthrough and on this particular stream I'll be playing the Democratic left because that's what that's what actually won out so we'll be doing that today so I hope everybody enjoys the content and I hope everybody is enjoying the game and if you have any questions feel free to leave it in the chat um, we'll go ahead and get started I've actually been playing through and I think I've recorded like five episodes already. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to start this over in order to do this. But I'll go back through and I'll play it uh, once I get done with the stream and then I'll resume my actual authoritarian right playthrough. So. You are my enslavement and my freedom. You are my flesh burning like a raw summer night. You are my country. Nazim Hikmet Ran. Nineteen oh eight in the Kingdom of Swordland. You open your eyes to this world. You came from, in this particular case, uh, in the authoritarian right playthrough. I actually did a wealthy family in the city of Lechaven. This particular time, I'm going to do a middle income family in the city of Holsord. Your parents named you Anton. As the only child of a diligent civil servant, you lived quite an ordinary childhood. Life was not bad. You were lucky enough to attend the well known public school, but frequent fights broke out at the Rain family home. These made, this, these made your family, you feel uneasy, excuse me. The years passed. During a history class at school, the bell started to ring unexpectedly. You heard a loud commotion outside. As everyone tried to figure out what was going on, the principal announced the historic revolution. The kingdom was no more. The Republic of Swordland was born. You did not fully understand. After graduating, you passed the university exam with high marks. You had the opportunity to choose between several studies. You chose, uh, let's see. Now, again, in my authoritarian right playthrough, I think I, I chose economics, basically because of money grubbing, uh, kind of money grubbing. But in this particular case, we're gonna choose law. Because again, we're leaning more towards the left, so gonna need that law background there. During the first year, you attended a lecture with David Whiskey. He was a well-known diplomat from the foreign ministry and the son of the president. After observing the hall in silence, he explained how the Supreme Court is obstructing justice in Swordland. He stated that laws should be applied fairly and that even the members and that even the members of the Supreme Court are subject to the same laws. You agreed in principle because you want fairness across the board. Soldiers entered the campus in the evening ahead of the first election. 
Many were in shock as the uniformed men created a security cordon and started arresting the teachers. A group of students started gathering in protest, along with your best friend, Peter Vectern. You decided to protest with the students. Now, again, in the authoritarian right playthrough, I chose to not uh, go ahead and protest with the students. You know, we were just kind of staying in the background, just not getting involved. This time, we're going to go ahead and get involved. One of the officers made a loud announcement that echoed through the campus. General Luteran declared martial law in order to restore the administration. Please stand back and disperse to your rooms. You join the students that slowly march towards the large group of soldiers. Suddenly, the soldiers charged. A student fell and was trampled as everybody started running away. You held your ground. We're gonna fight for our beliefs. The soldiers beat you relentlessly. It was a gloomy year. I'm a kid, that's probably gonna happen. The arrested teachers were replaced by those that promoted conformism to the state. Hosor turned a blind eye to the things that were happening. You didn't want to stay idle and decided to join. Now, once again, this is one of the things that kind of changed. I like how a lot of the dialogue has changed from the demo. So you're going to see a lot of little changes as you go along through the playthrough if you played the demo. I'm going to join a human rights group. The group heavily protested against the deteriorating human rights situation in Swordland. You contributed in thorough discussion on how to protect and expand freedoms. In one of the meetings, Peter introduced you to one of his friends, Monica, who was a volunteer for the Swordish League of Women. You were immediately attracted to her intelligence. The politically charged environment led you to we're gonna stay away from any political organizations. Now, if you saw the demo that I played, I went ahead and aligned with the Red Youth, the Socialists, and in the playthrough that I have on the channel, I started to join the Young Swords, the Nationalists, because that's what I'm trying to go through, go for. I'm trying to go for a more fascistic, a more nationalist playthrough, but this time I'm gonna stay away from any political organizations. We wanna try and strike a balance. The radio relayed that the communist general Ricard surrounded Lutheran and his troops, demanding their surrender. They refused and heavy fighting broke out across the country. You just couldn't believe it. The army was fighting amongst themselves. Swordland plunged into chaos. The clashes escalated into full-blown civil war. The horrors made you isolate yourself for a while. Monica helped you cope and love grew between the two of you. However, it was a difficult time for love. The chaos must end. The charismatic Colonel Tarquin Soul orchestrated a sudden coup and brought an end to the chaos. He wrote a new constitution and restored stability. The people saw him as a savior. He formed the United Swordland Party and ran as a presidential candidate in the first ever elections and you voted for United Swordland. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna be popping up in the chat. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. USP won the election by a large majority. After graduation, you kept seeing Monica and noticed her interest to marry. However, a letter arrived from the military calling you to fulfill your compulsory service. It was time to serve your national duty. A devastating civil war broke out in the neighboring country, Wayland, and you're gonna see them again very soon. <laughs> the distinguished major, Isof Lankia, ordered you to lead your squad on a border patrol mission. It was a very cold winter night when you began marching out of Gumarin Outpost. You could see your breath. After several hours of marching through the snowy hills, distant noises were heard. Visibility was too low to confirm the source. The squad crawled forward in formation and found a spot to observe. A group of refugees had made it beyond the border fence. You escorted them back or let them slip through. Now, once again, this is one of the things that I'm going to change. Now, again, in my nationalist playthrough, we're trying to protect our borders. We're trying to, you know, make this country strong with our own people. But in this particular case, we're going to go ahead and let them through because we're going to have an open border policy. And 
Another reason why I'm also going to do that is because I want to have some trade deals later on. So I want to be a little bit more open as opposed to having immig immigrants in the country. I don't want to go ahead and just turn people away, especially since the country that we're going to have to deal with is going to be a bit of a pain. So we're going to let them slip through and I'm probably going to get in trouble for this. After the patrol, Major Lankia arrived with anger and immediately relieved you of your command calling you a disappointment. One of your squad members had reported your actions. After several months of scrubbing the floors as a punishment, your duties ended and you went back to civilian life. Surprised you just wasn't discharged, but I guess when you need people. You and Monica decided to share your lives together. After receiving the blessings of her parents, a ceremony was held in Holsword. During the same year, you worked hard to secure a high paying job at the governing United Swordland Party. It was much more difficult to start your career on a good foot because of the refugee incident, but you still manage. Let me see. And I'm going to choose it was the best opportunity to change the country for the better. Again, I am all about trying to do the right thing. I'm, I'm about trying to help people. I'm doing this for the right cause. causes. I'm not trying to be some power hungry monster like the other person that I played through. You became the legal assistant to one of the more experienced members of assembly. You worked long and hard, staying late at work and going through hundreds of pages of legal documents. You were climbing the ladder. Saul strengthened the Republic by removing the institutions and symbols of the former kingdom from society. Things were also looking up for the country as the massive economic boom continued and people were the happiest they had been in a decade. Election time came and it was decided. President Tarquin Seoul was elected once more. Hey Arctic, how you doing? The ongoing legal battle between the Justice Ministry and the Supreme Court puts you under a lot of stress, but your significant contribution to the legal case triggered an invitation to meet President Tarkinsoul himself, who offered you a key position. You are to become the youngest member of Assembly. You accept it right away. As the youngest MP, it was difficult to connect with the influential inner circle. You needed allies, so you brought Peter as your right-hand man. The birth of your son, Frank, provided a brief moment of joy and relief. You sacrificed work to spend time with your family. Now, in the other playthrough I have, I chose the opposite. There are consequences for that, that's all I'm gonna say. During your absence, Peter found trustworthy contacts and strengthened your position in the party. At the same time, President Soul increased his authority over the years. His growing ego started to cause strife within the party. The cracks began to show. President Soul barely secured a majority in the election against the opposition leader. Over the past year, people were growing discontent with corruption and the worsening quality of life. Meanwhile, calls for a United Swordland Party Congress became louder as the leadership struggle started to brew. You watched from the sidelines, kept supporting the president, or joined the internal opposition. Well, we know how, well, I know how this plays out, and I think I'm just going to stay on the sidelines. Again, I'm just going to try and play in the middle for now until I get the reins of power. The contender for party leadership was Iwald Alfonso, a reformist and a talented business magnate with a growing popularity with the party. Hmm. Meanwhile, in a desperate effort to secure votes before the Congress, President Seoul was meeting party members one by one. All right, everybody, hold on one second while I go ahead and check what's going on with Steam.
All right, sorry about that. Let us continue. All right, the contender for party leadership was Ewald Alfonso, a reformist and talented business magnate with a growing popularity within the party. Meanwhile, in a desperate effort to secure votes before the, co the Congress, President Seoul was meeting party members one by one. He approached you to The president offered you the position of Minister of Justice and Law in the next government if you backed him in the upcoming vote. Hmm. I am going to stay out of it. This seems a little suspect, so yeah, we'll just stay out of this. The party congress was nothing short of impressive. The banners of United Swordland was decorating every possible spot. Thousands of influential political figures, lobbyists, and benefactors gathered for this turning point. The voting for the party leadership began. And I'm gonna vote for Ewald Alfonso. I think Tarkin Soul has had enough time in office. It's time that we turn around and get some new blood in here. Hello, Christian, how are you doing today? I hope you're doing all right. The efforts bore fruit as the contentious leadership vote was won by Ewald Alfonso. During the Congress, Seoul announced his retirement from politics. You knew the structure he had established was to stay. The country had become increasingly authoritarian. You... Mm, I'm gonna say we're gonna be happy that Seoul was finally leaving. A month later, your daughter was born. Monica named her Dana. She motivated you during a tumultuous period in the party. The general elections were approaching. The United Soiland Party was under the new leadership of Ewald Alfonso. You joined the party effort and campaigned for him. Hello, K Knight. Hope you're doing all right today. It's no problem at all. I really do like this game, so you have to thank... Uh, Torpor Games for this, so they allowed me the opportunity to stream on all these platforms, and I really do appreciate it again. So, During the general elections, the main opposition leader was embroiled in a sex scandal with his secretary, diminishing their chances. The extensive privatization program proposed by Ewald Alfonso secured an election victory for the United Swordland Party. Over the next years, you did your best in order to make Swordland a better place. That's what we're here for. The presidency of Ewald Alfonso saw many bold reforms, but was followed by a serious economic recession. The other parties announced their bids for the 1953 election, but the unfair system hampered all opposition efforts to win. You, hmm, were worried about the economic recession. It's not a problem at all. I really do appreciate it. Together with Peter, your presence in the USP grew and you became the face of a new wing in the party. You effectively took over the leadership as President Alfonso lost control of the country. The moment to make a move had come. You? Hmm, I'm just gonna advise Alfonso to step down. We're not gonna get too crazy with the inner politics and start being Game of Thrones-like and stuff like that. We're just gonna go ahead and advise him to step down. He didn't take your advice seriously and started to reshuffle his cabinet, but most of his inner circle abandoned him. Your diplomatic attitude made the party vote you in as the leader. Following this, you announced that you would be running for president in the general election with Peter as your running mate. It was your turn. After visiting every city and town during the campaign, you made a speech on state television. You promised to enact democratic reforms. That's what we're going to do. We're going to work with the opposition. We're going to try and enact democratic reforms and, you know, make Swordland a better place overall. 
The people are tired of empty promises. We need fundamental change in our institutions and government. A solid and transparent democracy awaits us. Brothers and sisters, a new constitution and a new age is upon us. The broadcast ended. On election day, millions went out to cast their vote. It was time to face the truth. Chapter one, President Reign. So as you see, there's a lot of choices that you can make in order to shape your character. And there's even more choices in the game to shape your character as well. So one of the things I wanna do that I was kind of enlightened to is that you can have a mixed economy. So I'm gonna start off promoting a planned economy as you've probably already seen. And I'm gonna try and stay out of the international politics as a whole, or at least picking a side in the international politics. I'm gonna try and stay my own way and have my own thing for our own country. So we're gonna promote the planned economy, but we're gonna use different corporations as opposed to using the state-owned corporations and things like that. And we're gonna stay out of this, like I said before. We don't wanna get in any type of battles between um, Arcasia or United Cantana. I don't wanna get involved in any of that stuff. So we're gonna try and play the middle. And who knows, maybe we can become a superpower ourselves. So we'll see how it goes. In recent years, Bluetooth, Wessex, and Agnolian immigrants flocked to Sorland due to relaxed immigration laws enacted by Yuval Alfonso. As a re result, tensions in between Sores and immigrants have been increasing. However, we're going to keep immigration relaxed. So, yeah. <laughs> He's very concerned today. Okay, we have also promised to focus on certain extensive subjects with, within our first term. The people expect us to solve the negative situations within this topic while providing an overall improvement to the related policies. So, we can either work on health, education, law enforcement, or military. Now, in my authoritarian playthrough, I'm going to focus on the law enforcement and military sections. I think the first thing I did was the military. But again, this is a democratic left playthrough. So we're gonna either focus on education or health. Now, I think in this particular case, I'm gonna go ahead and focus on education. In the demo, I believe I focused on health. So yeah, let's focus on that. Your promises will be remembered and they will have consequences. Are you sure about your decision? Yes, I am. Okay. And now we get into the meat of the game. So, and also just a little quick side note, um, for these type of games on my channel, I prefer to not have my face cam in it. Now in certain other uh, games that I play, you know, like the scary games and stuff, I will have the face cam on, but for this in particular, I won't have it. You wanna, you know, get, absorb get absorbed into the game and everything. So it's not about me, it's all about the game. Two weeks have passed since we won the election. And now I was about to be sworn in as the fourth president of Swordland. Thousands were watching the inauguration ceremony and cheering my name, Anton Rain. The die was cast. In the distance, the Maroon Palace stood on top of the famous Hill of Pride. I had no way of knowing what future awaited me there. I looked at my family. My son and daughter, Frank and Dana, were next to Monica, my wife. Her eyes were glimmering with pride. Then I turned towards the key people who made it all possible. Of course, each in individual was promised an important position in my cabinet. As my thoughts slowly faded away, the reality of the situation dawned on me. Orso Hawker, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, was waiting for me. And as you see, again, this might have been pointed out in the previous stream, but all these blue check marks, you can turn around and check out different things, different Wikipedia articles, if you will see. But uh, yeah, it is a load of lore in it, and it updates over time, so that's, that's also very cool. I really like that. Oh no, we're just getting into the game, so <laughs> the game has only just begun. The time for the oath has come. I am ready. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will respectfully execute the office of the president of Swordland. 
and to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. And to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the people and the constitution of the Republic of Swordland. You may now deliver your inauguration speech, Mr. President. So as I pointed out once again, uh, we did have a little issue about this one time before in the United States when um, President Obama was elected. Um, he actually slipped up some of the wording and he was so paranoid about there being technicalities or people using that against him that he ordered the Chief Justice to come back to the White House after the inauguration and read, redo the swearing in ceremony correctly just so nobody could turn around and say, well, you technically wasn't president or anything like that. So, But, you know, traditions and such. Thank you. Mr. Hawker, dear citizens of Swordland, a crowd, the crowd looked very eager to listen to me. Hmm. Yeah, we're going to go straight up Obama, change and hope. You, the people, have chosen. Together, we will bring prosperity and reform to our nation. It is a time of hope. It is a time of change. In the past, there have been times of survival, times of conflict, and economic hardship too. When, whenever we stood together, we prevailed. First, we must rewrite our broken constitution from 1929. I'm pretty sure Orso Hawker is gonna love that. <laughs> change now not in the next decade or years, today. Hundreds of thousands cheered. They were shouting my name in unison. I felt the responsibility, the power, and the burden all at the same time. I raised my fist in the air, which triggered a huge applause. I took a long look at the people of Sorland to burn this moment into my memory. One of the presidential guards came by to notify that it was time to leave. I made my way to the leading car in the motorcade. The presidential state car was a jet black Cadilla with flags of Swordland above the front headlights. Next to it, a man was holding the door. Hello, Mr. President. Still under the effect of the speech I made, hearing my new title made me smile. If you allow me to introduce myself, I'm Sergey, your new driver. Nice to meet you, Sergey. It's an honor. He respectfully bowed his head before opening the car door, gesturing inside. I entered the car. We'll be heading towards the palace. The motorcade began to move. On the way, Sergei proceeded to explain his duties as a driver. I'm guessing it's to drive? As minutes passed by, I found myself lost in thoughts again, barely paying attention to what he was saying. He suddenly made a gesture towards the now closed, uh, the now close closer palace jesus isn't it a beauty the maroon palace he was right sunlight glinted off the palace's many maroon colored domes it was so bright that i had to look away every time i look at it i'm reminded of my duty to this nation hmm let's see what we got here he's in good hands now just like the jerk that i am Let's see, uh, so do I, Sergey. This is the beating heart of the nation, after all. We all owe a great debt to the men who led this country from here. It's just a building. Even more of a jerk. <laughs> I'm gonna go with so do I, Sergey. It is the beating heart of the nation, after all. You know, trying to be relatable to the common people. Well said, Mr. President. The car drove past the majestic gates, continued uphill to the entrance, and stopped in front of the doors. Sergey got out of the car and opened the door for me. Have a great day, Mr. President. A Morgno West Corps. He refers to the famous swordish phrase from the times of revolution. A Morgno West Corps, Victorins is da, which meant morning will come, victory is close. I apologize if I butchered that. What's up, drippy man? You're not late, you're just in time. Join in on the fun. I made my way upstairs through the extravagant corridors of the palace. Marble and engraved wooden finishes decorated the interior. 
My footsteps echoed in the colossal halls. The guards bowed their heads in respect as I opened the massive doors to my new office. All right, and now we are in the game. So welcome to the Republic of Swordland. Everything you see here colored in is ours, and hopefully the entire map can be ours one day. <laughs> Just joking. Okay, but um, as you see, we have a number of reports. We can also check on things like the economy, the budget, our own personal wealth. This does change depending on what choices you made at the beginning. So for instance, um, right now I have a wealth of two because I am a middle income, uh, I came from a middle income family. Whereas when you choose to be from the higher class or from the wealthy class, you have a wealth of three. And you can use these for certain options later on in the game, which you'll probably see. And there will be different consequences for certain things like that. Now, I'm going to have to be a little bit more careful with my money because I don't know what actually this impacts, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be a big deal later on. Also, in my authoritarian playthrough, budget is zero. Really need to fix that. So, yeah. Also, we have different news organizations. Um, I did point this out in the demo. You have the whole sword post, Swordland Today, the Chaven Times, Radical, and the Economist. Oh, and the Geopolitical. Now, some of these do have some biased tendencies. For instance, the Radical has a more left-wing slant. I guess you could think of like Jacobin or things like that in the United States. Whereas the Lechaven Times, I don't think they really have to turn around and uh, I don't really think they have too much of a slant, or at least not from what I've seen. Sorland today, on the other hand, basically Fox News in the United States. They're like sort, they like Fox News, they're Sky, they're all those things. They have a bit of a, more of a conservative slant. Uh, the whole sort post also seems to be fairly in the middle of things. And The Economist, they're, think of, um, what is it? It's not the New York Times. It's, um, God, what's that business news? Forbes. It's like Forbes to a certain degree, so or CNBC to a certain degree. They have a bit of a conservative slant. They're all about turning around and, you know, capitalism. They hate the state planned economy and things like that. So, yeah, a lot of the things you're going to see are going to be pro business and stuff like that. But so you have to keep that in mind that, you know, you might get some fake news. You're going to have to be careful of your sources and stuff like that. So, anywho, we have a number of different reactions. So, from the economist, restructure the infrastructure. After the recent successful mega infrastructure projects from United Cantana and Vogsland, the world is warming up to the idea as a source of growth and employment. But is there any truth to this success? Our investment analysis indicates the infrastructure investments can be fruitful in the short term, but even more so in the long term, especially if they focus on linking economic nodes that business logistics depend upon. This is, however, the first step. The crux of the matter is diversification of investments where the government supports employment and growth. It is key to help private businesses with government contracts, tax breaks, and political support in order to create a self-sufficient and dynamic, ah, dynamic economy. The government's role in Sortland should be to integrate to the world economy and reap the benefits of global trade. Economic growth and income inequality in this country won't be fixed otherwise. So yeah, as you can see, they're all about turning around and uh, trying to promote tax breaks and stuff like that. In Solonomics, a new era begins for Swordland, and it holds many economic questions that will need to be answered by President Rain. Our top economic analysts from, uh, cons from, with consultation from the National Business Council have released a comprehensive report on the performance of the past 20 years. A certain section of the report stands out. The last two four-year plans of the plan doctrine created a budget deficit and a clear reduction of the industrial production output. This was specifically due to mismanagement and inefficient bureaucracy. The year-on-year -year budget balance and production index values indicate that the two most productive consecutive years had been when the privatization program of Alfonso began in 1949. Our editorial team, with the help of experts like Mikhail Avon and Edith Agnock have come to the conclusion that the recession was not actually caused by Eduardo Alfonso's bold privatization program, but by the drastic obstruction of state executive hindering the plan. The president, President Rain, must take the advice of planned economy proponents around him with a pinch of salt. Otherwise, he could find himself in the same spot of Tarquin Soul in the mid 40s. Yes, I do love reading. I read quite a bit, so. <laughs> I prefer audiobooks, actually, though. Okay, and the reaction from the radical, voice of the unheard. 
Let's see what we got here. I think we only have one article from them. Yeah, it's just the one. Okay. Another USP president. How many times will people fall for the same trap? We've seen this before with Colonel Soule, who supposedly saved this country and brought stability in times of chaos. His stability, however, meant a life of oppression. Any opposing voices were silenced and many were persecuted. Next was Alfonso, who was elected as the liberal reformer to bring change to the USP in Swordland. Seeing his unfortunate inability, his own cabinet resigned. As the third USP candidate becomes president, it is high time to realize that real change won't come from their party. So, they love me, as you can obviously see. <laughs> they really want me to turn around and be successful. They're all about everything that I'm doing. They love it. All right, and the Lechaven Times, the new assembly begins duty. President Anton Rain has been elected the fourth president of Swordland in the seventh Swordish elect elections. The United Swordland Party has won the election on Sunday with just over 37% of the vote, while Friends Richter, the leader of the People's Freedom and Justice Party, could gain just over 20%. Kassaro Kibner, the head of the right-wing National Front Party, is in third place with just over 11%. The Communist Party of Swordland and the Workers Party of Bludia both won just below 10% of the vote, failing to pass the 10% election threshold. The new term begins with the opposition of PFJP and NFP under the USP government. The unrepresented votes below the threshold resulted in the USP taking 52% of the seats in the Grand National Assembly, giving them the lawmaking power. The new seat numbers have finalized as follows usp 130 pfjp 70 nfp 40 and independence 10. so as you can see the system is not really that balanced or at least not very democratic so yeah it it does have a little bit more favoritism towards the united swordland party however this is one of the things that you can change later on in the game if you work with the reformists and if you make certain decisions it's all up to you now of course in my authoritarian playthrough, I'm trying to work with Kizarro Kibner because you'll see later on, he has some very interesting positions as far as to um, what the executive should have. No, this game doesn't require a big brain. This isn't a this isn't like a paradox game where it turns around and requires you to, you know, read the encyclopedia, you know, front and back, memorize everything and, you know, play the game for 15 years and still don't know how to play it. So, no, it doesn't require much. It's more of a, it's more like a choice of game. One thing I would probably recommend, though, is that um, if you do make certain choices as far as um, what your positions are and stuff like that, I would stick to it, you know, because it's just a typical thing in choice of games is that you want to stick to the choices that you make. You want to be consistent. You don't want to be all over the place about certain things. Otherwise, it could cause problems later on. So, because people will bring up the fact that you said that you were going to do this, but you went against it. So, be careful. All right. And now on to Fox News. I mean, Swordland today. President Anton Rain. The new president has been sworn into office by the Chief Justice Orso Hawker. Another great win for the USP and Anton Rain, who managed to get 37% of the general vote. The first congratulations came from Kazaro Kibner of the National Front Party. Oof. The runner up of the general vote, the PFJP, didn't concede until the last minute, but the results were clear since several hours in. Thousands of supporters have gathered in the streets of Holsor, chanting campaign slogans, waving flags, and displaying USP party banners to display unwavering support to the newly elected president. The public mood is very positive in the capital from all accounts on the ground. The city is celebrating that a Holsordian has become the president of Swordland. Okay. And the whole sword post. Rain spoke of change and hope. President Anton Rain has been sworn into duty in a great ceremony in whole sword. Thousands have attended the ceremony where President Rain has met with his supporters for the first time after his election. In his inauguration, Rain spoke about change and hope, bringing focus on reforms. Together we will bring prosperity and reform to our nation. It is the time of hope, it is the time of change. And the new president before he went uh, said the new president before he went on to start his first day in the Maroon Palace. All right. So I think it's about time that we start presidenting, shall we? So we have a number of reports. We have congratulations from world leaders and such. Let's check out over here. 
<laughs> I wish I could give the president a nice mustache. No, he was already blessed with this mustache. I would have preferred a nice beard too, but you know, maybe over time, that'll kind of, you know, just fan out. You know, maybe look like Duke Leto from uh, Dune in the new Dune movie. Read the report from Vogsland. Congratulations from Chancellor Hagel. Chancellor Hagel sent his congratulations on your great victory and wish for close cooperation between our countries in the future. Hagel signaled concessions from Vogsland in case of a promising trade deal. He also congratulated the Swordish democracy for the successful elections and warned us about the threat, Arcasia, the, the threat of Arcasia's growing influence poses for Eastern Marcopa. So yeah, you're gonna have Arcasia, AKA the United States, causing a lot of problems. But you're also gonna have United Contana, AKA the USSR, causing a lot of problems. So you're gonna have to deal with both of those at some point. However, you'll see that their allies, they have their own things. You know, they have their own things that they wanna do. They're gonna have their own plan. So maybe you can use that as a wedge. And if you know history, you might be able to use some of the examples from history in order to try and figure out how you're gonna plan dealing with these, these different countries. From Magnolia, congratulations from PM Van Horten. Prime Minister Van Horten congratulated us on our election and praised our party's stance on just and transparent elections. He signaled his wishes to continue the trade partnership between our countries as equal partners, as opposed to earlier trade deals, which he believes gave Sortland an unfair advantage. So you'll find out later on that because of some of the choices that we made in the beginning, he's gonna be a little bit more favorable to certain things that we wanna do because he likes the decisions we made. If you made different decisions, it puts you in a different spot. Now that doesn't mean that you won't be able to work with him still, but it does make it a little bit harder to turn around and work with him. All right. Uh, we don't have anything to do with Rumberg right now because they're jerks. And let's go over here to Wayland gonna find out that this is a lovely country by the way real lovely congratulations from president smolok president smolok sent his congratulations on the election victory and wished for a cooperative future between wayland and swordland signaling a desire to normalize the diplomatic situation between the two countries that's all you're gonna get for right now but again great country trust me Read the report from Lesbia. Congratulations from President Alvarez. President Alvarez congratulated you for the results and spoke about his hopes to have a beneficial partnership deal in the future. He sent his best wishes to the Swordish people and warned us about the threats of the encroaching Melanievis influence of United Cantana from the East, emphasizing the importance of unity in our continent, Marcopa. So as you will see, like a lot of the countries do have ties to United Cantana or Arcasia, but for the most part, they have their own internal problems. So they're more worried about dealing with that. Now, certain other events later on, you'll see will probably end up having an effect later on, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Let's see what's going on in Arvory. Lack of investments. The mayor of Arvory, Eric Neal, reports a lack of adequate infrastructure around Arvory, which seriously undermines the ah, attractiveness of Arvory's investment climate. Foreign investors, particularly from Magnolia, are becoming hesitant to invest in the city. Meanwhile, according to data published by the National Business Council, around 19% of a company's total expenditure in Aglin is absorbed by logistic costs, which in peer regions, this figure is below 10%. You know, I'm pretty sure if you watch my authoritarian playthrough that's gonna be coming out today, I probably will end up destroying everything. Just saying. So, <laughs> and let's see what's going on in Laren. Low production in Aglin. The report calls attention to the alarmingly low levels of, produ of productivity growth in the region of Aglin, where there's also are high rates of food insecurity, malnutrition, and rural poverty in inner parts of the region. So this region is once again, lovely place. You got a lot to work on. Hopefully we can do it. In Lechaven. Port of Lechaven loses importance. The latest marine traffic reports show that the Port of Lechaven is no longer the busiest of the Marcopa continent, falling behind to the third position. While this is a negative indicator for our administration, Lechaven still has the potential to shine again as a major trading center. The Port of Lechaven is the largest port of Sortland and holds enormous importance for the economy, particularly as the main distribution center linking the capital and inner parts of Sortland to the rest of the world. 
the major port city will hopefully keep supporting a possible economic upturn in the entire country if an investment project succeed. Oh, we get the nuke button later on. If you uh, work on a lot of other stuff, you'll get some um, nukes kind of just like shipped in and then you can send a spy over and then you'll turn around and be able to send nukes. I'm totally serious. All right, and let's see what we have in Whole Sword. We have to read the report from Whole Sword. Logistic, logistical issues, general staff gathers. Uh, we have a briefing on the current political situation in the office of the president of Swordland Maroon Palace. And we have a briefing on the current economic situation in the White Room of the Marine Palace, of the Maroon Palace. I agree. All right, logistical issues. The mayor of Holsord reports that the rising population and fast urban expansion has resulted in high levels of congestion in the city's traffic. The logistics report underlines increased traffic and slow transportation routes as the biggest problem of the capital. The mayor also reported that the absence of a well-designed large land-based uh, large land-based logistics center where all transports come together is one of the greatest problems for domestic transports because Holsord is a mega, is a met, is a big metropolis. Transporters are scattered all over Holsord having established such centers in 10 different districts. So it's like New York basically. All right, the general staff gathers. The general staff convened right after the election to congratulate our victory. All branches of the Swordish Armed Forces were represented in the meeting that took place at Camp Strongarm with massive security measures. The Chief of the Armed Forces, Vulcan Kruger, made a public press statement highlighting the increasing chances of military confrontation in Eastern Marcopa and requested support to strengthen the military. Now, as you see, the military has a little bit more influence than like here in the United States. Typically, the military just stays out of stuff. They don't want to get involved unless they absolutely have to. All right, let's look at the current political situation. Peter Vector arrived a couple of minutes early and sat across from me. He was struggling to hold back his smile. We did it, Anton. We won. Finally, all those years with our noses to the grindstone paid off. More like yours. You did most of the work, buddy. Peter's eyes sparkled. The strain of the past months had, had put a damper on his usual rackish charm. But today he was looking and acting more like his old self. He loosened his tie and undid the top two buttons of his shirt. Enjoying the new secretary I picked out for you. Thought you'd appreciate her gorgeous set of talents. It's a shame the rest of your staff aren't as easy on the eyes. All right, Peter, I'm a married man. And I'm actually not a jerk in this playthrough. He gestured to the slight paunch that protruded over his waistband. But hey, back in university, did you ever imagine we would be sitting here in the Maroon Palace? We have to celebrate this great victory. Uh, we will celebrate at the inaugural ball. Just hang in there until the evening. You know, I thought about doing that. I actually did think about replacing my, my face cam with uh, uh, by the, by the uh, presidential photo. But again, we're trying to, this is a serious game. We're trying to be more, you know, professional here. Okay, we was, okay. Looking forward to it. Evelyn hopes to congratulate you in person there. Let's see, good to know. I'm sure the kids would love to see their Uncle Peter for the first time as the vice president. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. That's great to hear. It's crazy how fast the two have grown up. You are a good father. Peter had a wistful look in his eyes. He and Evelyn had never been able to have kids of their own. During our campaign, the opposition had floated the rumor that he'd fathered illegitimate children during his wilder years, but it had never been substantiated. Huh. I don't remember that actually coming up in my playthrough of the authoritarian playthrough. So I wonder if that's gonna come up later on. You'll see that they have an interesting relationship, Peter and his wife. So, yep, President Darren Augustus. <laughs> yeah, it's serious until the nuke button appears. The door swung open and Lucien Galad, my chief strategist, walked in. He was a compact man with sharp bird-like features. After briefly surveying the room from wall to wall, 
He sat down, poured a glass of water, and opened his briefcase in a series of quick, graceful movements. Gentlemen, you know, he does kind of look like an angry owl. A tall case clock in the room struck three o'clock. Damn, you're exactly on time. Hello, Peter. Lucian then turned towards me. He very slightly bowed his head. He kind of looks like the guy from Homeland, too. Let's see. Lucian, how are you? I'm ready and able, sir. Lucian spoke in soft, clipped tones that immediately drew your attention towards what he had to say. Peter and I waited for him to proceed. We will start the meeting by evaluating the current situation. The majority of the Swordish people demand change. They are more concerned about the economy than the Constitution, but they blame the system for their problems. People are losing their trust in our democracy. This frustration even causes some to reason with figures like Bernard Sarkas. It is expected that we bring the change the last government did not. Also interesting, I don't think he actually said that in the last playthrough that I had, the authoritarian playthrough. He just noted that there were problems and stuff like that. So maybe he doesn't have any type of love for the communists in the country, or maybe even for the nationalists, I'm not too sure. But he seemed like he was more even, I guess you could say, in my authoritarian playthrough. Maybe because he agreed with my politics. I'm not sure. Franz Richter, leader of the reformists, believes that true change can also be done by transferring some of our powers to the assembly. I will move into the details of their demands shortly. Hmm. Now again, we're going for a democratic left playthrough, so we're going to agree with the reformists and we're going to try and work with them. I agree with the reformists. Our responsibility is to democratize our current broken system. That's exactly what we campaign for, a true change for the country to move forward. We will need many allies against the old guards in the government. Mr. Richter managed to influence many, many members of assembly to give their support for drafting a new constitution. Reformist politicians are quickly increasing in number. While the reformist wing inside our, our party is still a minority, they could have a tripartisan majority in the assembly, especially if they unite under friends Richter. Let's see. USP reformists aren't wrong to agree that we need to change, but we should be in charge. Mr. Richter could be a potential ally in our goal to maintain a majority in the assembly. Our party must fall in line with our position in the near future. We can't have a strong divide. Now, again, we're all about working together. So let's continue to work together. Mr. Richter could be a potential ally in our goal to maintain a majority in the assembly. He's definitely key in this. Reformist demands are clear. They want to limit the president's veto power, ensure that the Supreme Court is independent, and take away their right to vote on constitutional amendments. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the crazier things about this. Like, in the United States, the Supreme Court can't, I don't think they can necessarily vote on, yeah, they can't vote on constitutional amendments. They can make a decision based on a challenge to a law or something like that, but they can't vote on a constitutional amendment, literally having more power than the president. So, yeah, that's a little bit odd here, but, you know, these are, these are things that we can change. Let me see. I support the reformists. We need a proper balance of power in this country. I agree. It's better not to go against the wind of change that is raging around the country at this moment. The old guards will do their best to preserve the Constitution. Chief Justice Hawker and his allied judges have a great influence over the Supreme Court, which will be tough to break. And just like everything here in the United States, it's very tough to break anything. So, I mean, once again, I think I pointed this out in one of my videos. If you want to do like a constitutional amendment or anything in the United States, you need to pass it through the House, the Senate. Then it has to go to the states. It has to be ratified by a majority of the states. Then it can be changed. So the likelihood of anything being changed to the Constitution of the United States anytime soon? Nope. I think the closest thing we have to actual change to a Constitution is... Uh, I believe the issue of a constitutional convention. I think if a couple more states agree to it, then we can actually have another constitutional convention and rewrite the constitution. But even that's probably a long shot anytime soon. The court also has an abrupt power over constitutional legislation. Without their approval, we cannot even change it. Again, that's another thing too. The Supreme Court here in the United States can only decide on things that have been challenged 
and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And most of the time, even then, they won't even even acknowledge it. Case in point, the issue with the election that's going on right now in the United States. In in the case of a lot of the situations that's being you know brought up, even if it goes to the Supreme Court, the likelihood of it actually of them making a determination is pretty low. They'll probably just say, "Hey, you just do what the states tell you to do." And that's going to be the end of it. So, um, I don't know. At the very least, I'm going to stream until the end of the demo, and I might do a few things after that because things do get very interesting after that. So we'll see. I will stream as long as my voice can hold on. Speaking of which, I feel like I'm going to cough. <coughs> we must break the power of the Supreme Court one way or another. I agree. They have too much power over sordid politics. We need to take away their vote in constitutional legislation. It is absurd that an unelected branch gets to vote for bills. That is true. Looks like we have many challenges ahead. We'll figure it out. Our party still holds 130 out of 250 seats in the assembly. That is power. However, to reform the constitution, we must receive a two thirds majority in the Grand National Assembly, which is 166 votes, and a simple majority in the Supreme Court that equates to six votes. Yes, I'm gonna stream until I get that Viking beard. I've been working on it. After we've settled our thoughts on how to proceed, we will need to talk with our party figures. Our first goal must be to get the 150 signatures needed to start the process. Following the green light from the USP, we will reach out to the other party leaders to see if they would back our draft, and then the last step is to convince the justices of the court. The entire process will take a long time, but we must start working with the reform committee to evaluate all possibilities for a new constitution as soon as possible. And you're going to also see that some of the other choices we have are probably going to have an effect on it, too. For instance, we kind of stayed out of things. We didn't try to help Tarkin Soul. Soul has a lot of power, and I'm pretty sure that's going to come up again later on. But we did work with Iwald Alfonso. That might come up later on and be a problem. So we'll see. Let's see. We will write a more democratic constitution with the reformists. The new constitution should give the president wide ranging powers to lead Soylent into the future. We could work with the old guard to protect our existing extensive powers. Now, again, in my authoritarian playthrough, that's what I chose. But again, this is democratic. We're trying to be for the people. We're trying to work on things in this country. So we will write a more democratic constitution with the reformists. That's what we've been preparing internally. People elected us because of our promise for democratic reforms. The key thing here would be strengthening the power of the assembly, which we already lead with majority. Peter nodded in agreement. Oh God, it's midnight there. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep you up so late. At least it's Friday. Maybe that's a, that, that's a good thing. Oof. All right, see you, Christian. Yes, the division of power need to be rebalanced for a better swordland. According to the initial draft we made with the reformists, there are two changes to the constitution that are not open for their discussion. Lucien opened his dossier. First, the Supreme Court will no longer vote on constitutional amendments. Second, the president's absolute veto will be taken away. This can be replaced with a limited veto system by fixing the current loopholes. Hmm. Well, I guess I can go ahead and go along with that. Yeah, that, that's fine. I have no problem with these clauses. Let's work with the reformists. See you. Yes, sir. Lucian nodded. We will form a reform committee together with all parties and start reaching out to all the stakeholders in the assembly and the court for a new constitution. More information about the request of each parties and reform contents will be available later this year. Lucien took notes. Another important point. We must be aware that we must be aware about the Lothberg group. The oligarchs convene under this group to, con to influence economic policies. 
According to reports, some members of the National Business Council are in their pockets. They will surely try to bribe us for their special economic interests. Oh yes, they will. I've already been bribed in my other playthrough. <laughs> and also the Lothberg group, you can kind of think of like, um, what is it, the Bilderberg group. I don't even know if they still convene, but I'm pretty sure that's still a thing. I won't be bought. It won't happen. Peter, on the other hand, I'm not too sure about. As far as I know, Simon Hole has some ties to this group, and we may try using his influence if we deem it necessary. I'm aware of Mr. Hole's wide network. That will come in handy. We just need to be careful. We need to tread carefully on all sides with all power players in order to survive our turn. Lucien looked at his watch. Well then, gentlemen, precisely 30 minutes. This concludes our political briefing for today. Our next meeting will be about our media strategy. Talk to you soon, sir. I will keep in touch. See you in the next meeting. Lucien, Anton. Lucien and Peter bid their farewells and left. All right, so we're getting introduced to a little bit of the reform situation and how we're going to tackle it. We also have some more reactions to deal with. Okay, a committee for reforms. Speaker Gloria Tory said that a committee which, can, which includes all three political parties of the assembly has been formed for the preparation of potential changes to the constitution. The committee has been asked to submit a comprehensive report to find a solution for the current problematic state of affairs and the governmental institutions. Tory said, USP wants to appeal to the people of Sorland to help in maintaining stability and order in the state. The details of the committee regarding its actual topics or its members have not been clarified. <laughs> yeah, Peter is such a president name. President Peter. Also, um, in my other playthrough, I've actually gotten to the meeting about the reform to when I, mean, I got to the reformist uh, meeting. It didn't go well. It went really bad. <laughs> so I know there's going to be bad consequences for that. But once again, it just goes to show you things can change at the drop of a dime. Support and assembly grows for for campaign finance bill. And this is going to be one of our first decisions right here. A bill to change the criteria for the allocation of public funds to political parties is proposed by Representative Albin Clavin from the USP. The bill aims to change the criteria from the proportion of votes won in general elections to proportion of seats won by a political party in the Grand National Assembly. This will result in an increase of about 28 million uh, Swordish wrens to the governing United Swordland Party, which will benefit the most from the proposed bill. The new bill would give political parties an annual amount of 500,000 Sorland Wrens per member of assembly. So as you can see, we're still trying to rig stuff in our favor. So, because again, it's going by the actual seats, not by the actual amount of votes, which have been decreasing over time due to our long standing control over the country. Swordish National League starts season. A very exciting day marks the Swordish National League kicks off with the SK Lechaven versus Benfi FC match. The league consisting of nearly 10 teams has been gaining more and more popularity in recent decades, with, th with tickets dropping significantly and prices leading to increased stability, I mean, uh, increased accessibility. Football fans are looking forward to one of the key events of the league, the match of the two most competent teams, Enrica and Gilsword. So, something to look forward to there. I wonder if we can actually go to the game later on. So, would be a nice little change of scenery. Rumberg coming south. Our foreign policy analysts who are reviewing the recent aggressive military and diplomatic developments of Rumberg have come to the conclusion that it is highly likely that Rumberg will keep trying to push further south, threatening the territories of Swordland, Wayland, and possibly Agnolia. The annexation of Dome many decades ago was just the beginning. Rumberg seems to be on a quest to secure all strategic resources in East Marcopa. Now, again, this is one of those things I'm kind of wondering about because you can work with just about anybody in this game. So I'm wondering if we can kind of come to some type of diplomatic resolution, but you're going to see there's a lot of stuff both within your country and outside of your country that's just pretty much begging people to turn around and, you know, have you start a war with Rumberg. So 
But we'll see how it goes. I'm going to try and stay out of all these conflicts if I can. Now, my other playthrough, it's probably going to be a war. It's going to be great. All right, let's see what's going on in Dayer here. Increasing homelessness. That's always wonderful. The region of Berzia is among the worst hit regions in Sorland, where homelessness has skyrocketed since the economic recession. The number of homeless in the city of Dayer is more likely to have increased by 25% in the last year. Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure we can have war. I'm pretty sure we can have a lot of war. And again, if you if you kind of look at a lot of the, the lore that's going on in the game, especially between United Cantana and between Arcasia, you can see that it has a lot of, you know, it, it has a lot of analogies to the uh, Cold War and things like that, especially when you find out one of these other news articles is about to come up here in a little bit um, that wasn't in the demo. So I'm pretty sure that a war can break out, hence the reason why you'll need to decide on what to do diplomatically, because thing, things can go south real quick. Now as to, now as to who you're going to get into a war with, I don't know. I hope in this playthrough I don't get into any wars, but we'll just have to see. We'll just see how things go. Okay. The rise was, was particularly stark among bluish people, where homelessness increased by 72% in just six years. Good God. It is reported that that homelessness among ethnic minorities has reached the highest level in more than a decade. The bluish minority of the region now account for up to 47% of all homeless people there. That is definitely a situation that we have to get under control. Let's see, I don't think we have any other... Yeah, we don't have any other things over there. So let's read the report from Holsort, Public Opinion Report. People's views on the need for democratic reform in the government structure has changed over the last decade. Reformist propaganda from the leader of the People's Freedom and Justice Party, Friends Richter, have resulted in a massive increase in the demands for democratic reforms. It is estimated that currently 55% of the population supports the reformist ideas. It's also funny to me how like in other countries you can say, you know, propaganda, no problem. Whereas like if you say propaganda in the United States, it immediately has a bad, you know, connotation to it. So definitely might want to stay away from that word. All right. Um, let's see. Let's, let's do the economic situation because we say we were going to meet him later on. Also, let me take a sip real quick. Thank you for the follow. I cannot see it on my screen, but thank you, thank you, thank you. I really do appreciate it. All right. Briefing on the current economic situation. Simon Hall, Gus Manger, and Lilius Graff were about to arrive in the White Room for our scheduled economic meeting. This was the room in the Maroon Palace where all important meetings were held. Two assistants arrived first, carrying a heavy projector. They stood with it by the door, waiting for the ministers to enter. From the hallway, I heard Lydia Graff's voice. She was using the patient, almost motherly, excuse me. She was using the patient, almost motherly tone she often took in heated arguments. Gus, do you really think that such an economically advanced area is more in need of investments than Aglin? Lilius, my interior minister, strode in. She was clad in shades of brown and beige, the only spot of color a bright yellow nourish star on her necklace. Gus followed close behind. Hey, how's it going? You doing all right today? Don't be an idiot, Lilius. What about the unemployment crisis in, in the greater Holsord and Gelsland regions are going through? These areas are our economic heartland. Gus curled his hands into, into fists. The Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development's temper hadn't changed since his days in the Alfonso administration, but neither had his reputation for getting things done. His far-reaching network of connections was unlike any other. Simon Hall quickly stepped between the two ministers without looking at either of them. He cleared his throat. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, everyone. Well, let's see what this debate about. Let's see what's actually going on. Just a disagreement in internal economic strategy. President Rain. Not sure if I would call it just a disagreement, Lilius. 
Hmm. Could you enlighten me, Gus? I would prefer some information here. That's what I asked for. Ms. Graff seeks to focus our economic development in a region where we can where we can't reap the financial benefits. Business leaders are requesting better logistical lo logistical links in order to contribute to the economy more. A wise idea if your main agenda is to make money instead of developing the region and serving the people. Lilius, could you elaborate? Of course, the argument is simple. England is our weakest region, both in terms of economic and social support. We should support the city of Arvory and its respected mayor. How impartial can you really be? Simon was observing the argument. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have actually kind of stirred this argument up. Let's see. Mmm. I'm picking it aside one way or the other. Well, again, this is a democratic playthrough, so I'm going to go ahead and say I agree. Aglan needs investment. Lilius smiled and folded her hands primly. I have to say that I agree with both of them. Anglin is in need of investment, and we can improve Greater Holsword and Gelsland. I want to avoid this topic now since we will talk about it in the future. I would rather first fully brief you on our current economic situation. Uh, this is Suzerain. It is a political narrative thriller game. It's a choice of game. It's not like how you see certain simulation political games where it's a lot of choices that you have to make. This is more of a, like I said, it's more of a choice of game. So it's a little bit more chiller and everything, but it has a lot of narrative in it. Um, it's a really interesting game too because it has a lot of lore in it. The developers did such a great job putting so much lore into this game. It has its own Wikipedia pages, as you can see, that pops up. Any of the blue lines you see are things that you can actually look into in the game. And it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And it also has a lot of analogies to things that have happened in real life. So, yeah, it just came out today. You can check it out on Steam. I'm not sure how much the price is for it. But, yeah, it just came out a few hours ago. Oh, I mean, it has its own internal wiki. So, like, if you look over here to the side, this is one of the characters in the game. And she has her own history and everything right there. But then you can turn around and click on Tarquin Soul. He has its own history. Um, the Republic of Swordland. He it, it has its own history. It is just loads and loads of lore. So again, it's a lot of thought that went into this. A lot of effort went into this. So again, I encourage everybody to to play it. So. You know, and make certain decisions for yourself. Now, I do have um, on my YouTube channel later on today, because today I'm playing a authoritarian left, I mean, not authoritarian left, but a democratic left playthrough on my channel. Later on today, I'm going to go ahead and have a authoritarian right playthrough. And once I actually go through that, I'm going to play some other routes as well. Maybe try and get some of the more obscure achievements, some of the secret achievements. But yeah, definitely check it out. I want to avoid this topic now since we will talk about it in the future. I would rather first fully brief you on the current economic situation. Simon pulled a silk handkerchief out of his pocket and briefly wiped his glasses. <coughs> My staff and I have comprehensively an analyzed every aspect of he was interrupted by a groan from one of his assistants by the door, both of whom were now visibly struggling to hold up the heavy projector. I'll just go ahead and buy it. You know there's going to be nukes. There's going to be lots of nukes. And if they're not nukes, they're going to be lots of military action. So lots of explosions, shock and all, that type of thing. So just go ahead, do it. Oh, you can put that there. He pointed below the painting of President Soul. The assistants placed the projector next to the table and installed a white screen on the wall. Leave now. I mean, thank you, and please leave now. Came up a little harsh there. The assistants left the cabinet room and I... Oh, excuse me. The assistants left the cabinet room. I was reminded that Simon had never quite had a way with people, but his facility, or his faculty, with numbers had made him the most sought-after economic specialist in Swordland. 
Simon started looking for his slides. He always carried documentation around with him. Wait, I'll be, I'll not be a jerk this time and just go ahead and wait. Lilius leaned to the table and spoke. Simon, what happened to the new police station construction in S in Estord? And again, all the regions also have their own lore as well. While going through his briefcase, he paused for a moment to answer. It got stalled due to a government property boundary issue. I've been meaning to look at it. I can take a look at that one. Estord needs all the security help it can get. Sure. More time for me to spend on analysis. His eyes glittered when he finally found the slides he was looking for. There have been some developments about the Swordish Wren losing further value today. We've been trying to stabilize it with the central bank. The recession of 51 put enormous pressure on the economy, resulting in the collapse of the value of our currency. The entire situation was a significant cause of concern for our administration. What would you like to know about the current economic situation? Uh, you know, because I'm definitely an economy major and I definitely know about all this stuff. What is our GDP and debt situation? <laughs> our current GDP is 310 billion Swedish friend and the national debt is 427 billion. It's still hard to fathom that we lost nearly 150 billion in wealth. The past three years were tough. Kind of like what happened with coronavirus, like all the gains that we had over the past four years just evaporated in about a week or so. <laughs> what is our unemployment and inflation rate? Unemployment has skyrocketed and is now at a staggering 16%. The inflation is, a rel is at a relative high of 7%. Unemployment is increasing crime and drug use. We need to get people off the streets. The inflation isn't helping our average citizen either. What is the status of the recession? And I think if you look at that comparative wise in the recession of 2008, I think unemployment was like 9% or something like that. So that's nearly double that. The economy has been in recession of about negative 6% in the past year. The average GDP has dropped from the Swedish rand of 15,454 per capita to 10,359 Swedish rand from 1951. So, Jesus, a cut of about 5,000 bucks there. This administration's success depends on our ability to stop the recession. The sooner we can reach GDP growth, the better. I have all the information needed. Let's move on to the economic strategy. Simon scattered the paper stack in front of him in an orderly manner and took a final look at his notes before clearing his throat. As you can see, the situation is alarming, but not everything is negative. The extensive privatization program of, Al of Alfonso left us a large budget surplus which we can use to stabilize the crisis. The primary subject we need to settle on is what general path we will take in our term. Solonomics based nationalization happened in the 30s and Alfonso's privatization began during the end of the 40s. What will our administration focus on? One of our main promises was to promote a planned economy to stop the recession. To be frank, I still don't think this was a good idea. We shouldn't go back to Solonomics. It is the reason of the recession. Self-sufficiency will help us in tough times. Simon ignored the statement. Now, again, you can choose a state plan economy, you can choose a free market-based economy, go full United States if you want to, but you can also do a mixed economy. So, and that's what we wanna turn around and do. Because I think a mixed economy would kinda help more in this situation, but um, for our democratic left playthrough or whatever. So that's what we're gonna try and shoot for. We're gonna try and shoot for having some, you know, big projects, but you know, maybe with some state-owned corporations or having some big projects with some other corporations to see how things go. Also, we're going to try not to be corrupt. I'm pretty sure it's going to be hard, but we're going to try not to be corrupt. Let's see. Economic systems without regulations are bound to fail. 
Obviously, there is some regulation in all of the existing systems. Otherwise, it would be anar anarchy. Nobody wants a chaotic, chaotic society. Oh, you'd be surprised. From taxes to the standards of, of good, there are many elements that regulate all aspects of this system. But is it enough? I doubt it. If we can manage to plan more aspects of the economy, our chances of success would increase with a talented team like ours. The structural problems of solonomics were going to lead to a, a recession according to the predictions at the time anyway. Either way, even if we picked one of the doctrines, we retain the option to make economic choices on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's what we're going to do. We're not just going to stay straight to a state plan uh, economy. We're going to make certain decisions as time goes along. One of the decisions I'm going to make is that you've probably already seen you have the choice of two different projects and what corporations to choose. So I'm going to choose the highway project when it comes up, but I'm also going to choose the tourist company. And there's two reasons why I'm going to do that, but I'll get to that later. That is, however, not recommended in my point of view. <laughs> the last thing we need is a chaotic economic plan. Chaos is great. Chaos is not a pit. It's a ladder. Finally, something we can both agree on, Lilius. There's another important point which has a direct impact on our economy. Superpowers. And we're definitely not one of them. We've done well not aligning ourselves with any one of them. Economically speaking, an isolationist policy overall could only work if we were to reap benefits of both spheres and their rivalry. This is very dangerous to attempt, but still possible. We must be very cautious. There are schemes being devised about, about Sorlin. We cannot give in to their wants now or in the future. Otherwise, our country will turn into a pawn. Hence the name Suzerain. Okay, let me see. Sorlin will not be controlled by any nations. That's what I'm also trying to go for in this playthrough. Now, in my authoritarian right playthrough, I'm trying to go for a more Arcasian leaning political situation. So I want their technology. I want their free market capitalism. I want all their wealth and everything else in between. That's what we're going for here. Precisely my point. We will stand strong and show an example to the world. I hope we won't regret this. Simon cleared his throat. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Minister Whiskey will be in charge of informing you on those type of foreign policy decisions. We must first decide on our internal economic plan. Simon put forward a legal document outlining the possibilities with both economic doctrines listed. The cabinet members looked at me. We have to thank Seoul and his planned economy for the boom. It clearly shows the success of the plan. Let's finish what Alfonso started with the capitalist free market reforms. His path was going to enrich Swordland. Would a planned economy focus bring us stronger allies? What's on our long-term economic schedule? Yeah, let's go with that. Picking a construction company, trade relations, tax reform, and welfare privatization or nationalization initiatives would be some of them. So I'm definitely going to nationalize the welfare system. Well, actually, I might privatize them. Depends on the options that we have when it comes up. Tax reform, I'm probably going to go with a more progressive tax system. We'll see what trade relations has and what countries we can work with. And I already know what I'm going to do with the uh, construction company. We must choose wisely and remember that the free market economy in all forms is the future of the world. Right. I wouldn't be so sure. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's just not address it at all. We're just going to move on. Let them have their philosophical debates about what is what. What are your final thoughts then, Mr. President? Let's see. Critical institutions must remain in state control. We must be fully responsible in delivering services. We should look at opportunities like privatization to create financial resources. A market economy doesn't require as much guidance and could help us attract foreign capital. It's hard to fully agree or disagree with these options. I'm going to stick with this. Critical institutions must remain in state control. We must be fully responsible in delivering services. Again, Democratic left. So let's go with that. Even though honestly here in the United States, I don't even think that could be classified as democratically left. So, you know. Few could be. It wouldn't be negative, but either way, you make the choices. So what will our general economic plan promote? We will promote a planned economy as we promised. 
Again, you don't want to go against your campaign promises. That's a good way to start off on the wrong foot. Unless you're a politician in the United States. Completely different. Not sure if we made the right decision here. Gus looked worried. Now that there is clarity on which direction we are heading, I will work on a good plan accordingly. This concludes our meeting. In our next gathering, we will talk about the upcoming infrastructure investment plan. Now that the, the economic direction was taken, the ministers dispersed for lunch at the Maroon Palace. All right, so we made our first big decision here. We went ahead and decide or decided on our economic plan, or at least the intent of our economic plans. And as you can see, we have more reactions to deal with, and I'm sure the news is gonna love this. Maybe the radical won't be so harsh today. Swordland today. Economy meeting held in Holsword. Contacts close to the government report that yesterday, Swordland's economic policy policies have been planned behind closed doors. Shortly after the meeting that was also attended by President Rain, the Ministry of Economy has released a statement regarding their short-term economic plans, which included the promotion of planned economy. Okay, very short and to the point. But you'll see later on that's probably going to change. Freezing temperatures recorded. The Meteorological Institute has reported the record low temperature of negative 29 in the city of Luzerne. A warning for, the frost, for frostbite has been issued in the cities of southern Bergia. People are advised not to go out unless they have to due to a risk of frostbite. Schools are closed for this period. Sounds like Wisconsin. All right. The Radical, they have an issue with nationalist violence. A man in his 20s has been beaten with, with uh, baseball bats in a paramilitary, nah, paramilitary style attack in Arvory. I apologize. The man claims to have been attacked because of his ethnic background as an agno Swordish citizen. He was approached during a walk at the park by a group of right-wing extremists who are suspected of being regulars at the local National Front Party office. The group inflicted injuries to his legs and arms, police said. The man was brought to, to, to the hospital after making his way to a nearby property. The police service of Arvory said it was a brutal attack for which there is no justification. There's no place for attacks such as this in our society, said Eric Neal, the mayor of Arvory, and called for unity and urged restraint from the populace. So, yes, we're starting to have some political violence. Always great. Now from the economists, I'm sure they're gonna love the whole state plan economy thing. Oh, but this is about Armadine Industries. Armadine Industries pioneering electronics. A new prototype for the first pocket radio was displayed by the Arcasian electronics company, Armadine Industries in Ventry City. After six years of research, the engineers behind the pocket transistor radio have revealed that the material science questions regarding the, comp the composites have been solved. The company is now filing the patents for the product. The CEO of Armadine, uh, for, of Armadine, Aaron Bridges, is predicting an IPO at VCSE in the upcoming years. In a bid to raise further investment, Mr. Bridges has called for all venture capitalists who believe in the future of science and technology in the marketplace to invest in the company. The president of Arcasia, Dwight Walker, praised the bright minds of Arcasian engineers following the announcement and called further technological advancement for the military industrial complex. Interesting. And he also totally doesn't look like, like Richard Nixon. All right. Now to our own stuff. Increasing unemployment in, Mor in Morna. The number of people filing for unemployment in Morna continues to rise as the recession continues. The change in economic conditions is historic and stunning in its speed, said the mayor of Morna. In the aftermath of the crisis of 1951, the unemployment rate in Morna reached 9% in 1952, a year after the financial crisis. The last six months have almost erased all the gains in employment over the last two decades. Hey, Juju, what's going on? I almost said, hey, Jude. <clears throat> All right, we have a promising agricultural growth report from Sarna. For the first time in three years, the agricultural output of Sarna has increased. Many experts link it, link it to both a drop in the temperatures and new farming practices that have been adopted in recent years. 
Additionally, the farmers are now accessing more generous credit allowances from the government that were left over from the Alfonso administration. The Ministry of Agriculture reports that the agricultural industry of the region has the potential to become a powerhouse in the future if investments persist. Now, that could also be interesting because we're going to have to worry about infrastructure later on. So we need to start building up some of this infrastructure in certain parts of the country. We really need to work on that. Hopefully we can do that. We'll see. And we have a report from Gil Sword about infrastructure. The recession led to a reduction in rail assets, assets, with more than a fifth of the railway network itself antiquated, being mothballed in the recent years. While the main lines of the railway network are currently in service, increasing demand in goods from Gelsor to the capital is pushing the network to its limits. The rail signaling system in the region dates from the middle of the last century and is also in need of improvement. Jesus. Sounds like some of the Eastern European countries. Or the Midwest. Infrastructure report from Linkirk. The recent collapse of the tourism industry in Linkirk has led to a reduction in trade traffic and road maintenance. The road network is currently in service, but is in need of substantial improvement. Ports, country roads, and bridges similarly suffer from a lack of investment. Firms doing business in Linkirk report a significant shortage of warehouse facilities, particularly refrigerated facilities, with implications both for the transportation system and the ability to serve the population's basic food and health needs. So again, you're gonna see that there's a project that's gonna come up. Maybe you might wanna do something about that. Again, it's all up to you. Okay, so we have to invest in mega infrastructure. That was one of the things that we were talking about before, but we also have more reports. So we have to have a meeting on the media strategy here. We'll go ahead and take that. And then after we deal with the media strategy, we'll go and decide on the mega project. Lucien and Peter arrived at my office to talk about recent developments and the media strategy. They both took their seats across from me. Lucien put on his reading glasses and quickly went over some documents. Peter turned to Lucien and nodded. Let's begin. First of all, Lucien, you mentioned that Marcel Coranti contacted you. The Corantis has all, had always been known as one of the richest and most influential families in Sortland. Marcel Coranti was no exception. He was the oldest son of Conrad Caronti, the industrialist and media mogul who founded HOS, the richest man in the entirety of Swordland. Lucian turned to me. He has offered to meet with you, Mr. President. Hmm. Why is Conrad sending his son? Unfortunately, he passed away today. Well, after passing of his father, of his father, May he rest in peace. Marcel aims to become the next CEO of the HOS conglomerate. He mentioned a productive collaboration. They are a powerful and influential media conglomerate. To start with, they own the Swordland Today newspaper, the Swordish Broadcasting Corporation, the S which means it would be wise to have them by our side. Sorry for interrupting. What does this productive collaboration entail? Surely nothing, you know, nothing unsavory at all. Surely. He did not wish to explain the details over the phone, but rather in person. I believe I will be receiving a call from him sometime soon. However, as Peter said, they have substantial power over the content, uh, over the content of media outlets, headlines, radio shows. That is what he would be offering. What he wants in return is what we need to understand. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, we need to determine our general approach to media. I have far less expertise in the matter, but very interesting arguments were made by Lucien at the preparation meeting yesterday. There are two ways we can approach the media. One of them is by influencing it, with, which has clear advantages, and the other one is keeping it independent. Hmm. Now, typically, I would like to be in control of the media. I wouldn't want them just going off saying whatever they want to. But again, we're being more democratic. We're trying to be nice and stuff like that. You know, we're trying to be peaceful. We're not trying to be, you know, taking over newspapers and, you know, turn into China or Russia or something like that. So we want them to remain independent. God, I hate it. <laughs> Ideally, yes. But an unpopular leader will not be able to pass even the easiest reforms. 
It is of the ut of utmost importance to maintain the public popularity and avoid any damaging scandals or mistakes. I must stress one thing, Mr. President. The more people we have on our side supporting our agenda, the more we can accomplish. With someone on our side in an influential media organization, we can do this very easily. I am accepting power, but not really. I'm, I'm not trying to influence power. I think one of the things that you can kind of do in this game is use the power of people. So for instance, you're going to see a crisis incident that's going to come up um, later on in this game and you can appeal directly to the people. And that can be a powerful thing because at the end of the day, Swordland is just one factor. The heart of Swordland is just one factor. So I'm going to try and use the power of the people. And even then, I'm going to try and appeal more to actually getting things done. So if I lose power in the end, as long as I achieve the goals that I set out for, that's what I'm that's what I'm shooting for. So how noble of me. Now, my other playthrough, I'm just taking power. I don't care. So but in this one, let's try and work on actually getting things done. Hooray. I see what you're getting at. Now, nah, two wrongs don't make it right. How noble of me. That might be the case at times, but it's hard not to forget what happened to President Alfonso during, la during his last year. Things got even worse after his cabinet resigned and the media started to slander him, but that also, but that has also to do with his inability of strategic political maneuvering. Two knocks were heard on the door. Please come in. Livia Suno, my new secretary, entered the office. Her dark curls bounced as she crossed the room at my desk. She spoke with a slight tilt or lilt in her voice. Excuse me, Mr. President. Mr. Glaude's secretary has been calling me and wanted me to relay a message. Marcel Caronti, the new CEO for HOS Conglomerate, is on the line for Mr. Glaude. Well, the ball's in our court now. Would you like to talk to him, sir, or would you like me to? Uh, you go ahead. Connect the line to my office. I don't want any part of this, unfortunately. Right away, sir. Connecting the call to the line. I have a feeling she's going to become a problem at some point. It's just, I, I like I keep saying this, and I said this during the demo. I can just feel the Monica Lewinsky from her. It's just, it's just, I can feel it. Lucien picked up the phone and started to listen. A few minutes passed as the two talked over the phone. Good news indeed. Congratulations, Mr. Caronti. Thank you for contacting me about this. We will talk later. Lucien Galad put the phone down. What was so important that it couldn't wait? He was just elected to be the CEO by the board of directors. He offered a partnership deal regarding his media branch. He is inviting us to his resort near Conriot for a meeting. The board has decided rather quickly. It seems that it seems that gave him the confidence to approach, approach us again. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Caronte is going to be a problem at some points, but you know, Soul left me with some very powerful powers as the president. So, you know, as much as I, you know, am a nice guy, I would hate to have to use some executive authority to, I don't know, you know, maybe decide what the media can and can't do. Maybe they have to be more fair and, ba fair and balanced, like how we had the fairness doctrine here in the United States once upon a time ago. But you know, that, that's just if things get out of hand. I'm sure they won't get out of hand. Hint, hint, wink, wink. He's going to offer a real deal and now has the power of the conglomerate too. The choice is up to you, Mr. President. I can set up the meeting soon. And at the end of the day, his power is based off of the power he gets from the board. So maybe we can drive a wedge between that, or maybe we can turn around and kind of influence them. Who knows? We'll see. Hmm. I do not want to associate with a media mogul, reject the offer. So we're gonna stay away from this completely. That is a clear no. Very well. I hope we've made the right call. Well, that makes things clear. 
We should focus on other things anyway. Lucien looked at his watch. Looks like we ran out of time for today. We will continue where we left off later. Thank you for your time. <laughs> I expect you to bring better potential allies to the table. Again, I won't be a jerk. I think Lucien is doing a good enough job as it is, so. See you soon, gentlemen. Lucien and Peter gathered their documents and promptly left my office. We were already getting the attention of key and potentially dangerous figures. Of course, the rats come out first. And as you can see, we had the codec entry added for Marcel Caronti, and they updated based off of the choices we made. And they will continue to update as we make more choices. All right, so let's see what we got here. We got the mega structure project that we still have to invest in. We have news articles. We also have the campaign finance bill that was talked about in the previous article. So like I said, you got to see certain things in news articles and they're going to come up later. So, so far I haven't seen one thing in this game that didn't come up later that was in a news article. Now again, there's a lot of lore just because, but thus far I haven't seen one thing that hasn't come up later on. So keep that in mind. It's good to have that information in the back of your mind. Thank you, Green Project. I didn't need you to pop up there. But, um, okay, we have to read the report from Whole Sword, the party committee report. And I think that was pretty much it. So, let's deal with the news. First, let me deal with my throat. Jesus Christ. <coughs> from Swordland Today. Conrath Caronti passed away. The first and most important modern entrepreneur Sortland has ever seen has sadly passed away today. People looked up to Conrath Caronti as a figure of success, respect, and wealth. After his immediate passing, his son Marcel Caronti took over his title as the new CEO of the Heart of Sortland conglomerate. That's it. Very matter of fact. And from the radical, glamorous inaugural ball. Oh, I'm sure they're going to love this. The whole sword elite gathers for a lavish state ball. Many citizens in the country are uncertain about their own future, but the state has no problems with wasting taxpayer money, taxpayers' money right from the start. We demand that these traditions of wasteful nature will become a thing of the past once the president settles in. The team here at the Radical will keep fighting for a better, more equal tomorrow for all. And again, they love every bit of all the extravagance and all the glory that we have going on with the ball. So, gotta love it. And from Geopolitical, let's see what we got here. Let's see, Swordland's regional trade. As the Reign administration starts its first term, there is a question in all our heads. What will be the regional international trade policy? Due to the strategic geopolitical location of Swordland, historically, Agnolia and Wayland have been natural trading partners. Depending on the direction of the Reign administration, we think it is likely that a new trade deal will be brokered with, a, with at least one of these partners in the near term. Or who knows, maybe we can finagle our way to work with all of them. All in all, regardless of which trading partners the administration decides to go with, one thing is for sure, regional trade will boost the ailing economy. The real question is, what does Vogsland and Lesbia think about Sortland? Oh yeah, that's the thing about Caronti. Like, you can definitely say, you know, unbiasedly, that media is a very powerful thing. I, I remember, um, if you remember during the primaries, for instance, um, the Democratic primaries, Michael Bloomberg had no support at all. Absolutely zero support. And he spent, I believe it was estimated between 500 million and a billion dollars on advertisement advertisements and stuff like that. I remember getting so many of those ads. He went from 0% to 33% within about a month or two. And of course, when he got to the debate, he got flayed alive and everything else in between. But that just goes to show you that you don't need anything. You just need, you know, just pure media. Is It's a very powerful thing. And that can even be said with Fox News. There was a, a documentary that was done on, um, I think it was Kansas. Kansas was one of the leading um, bastions of left-wing activism in the United States for a long time. And 
after you know a lot of media represent representation went through after a lot of you know politics went through it went from being unabashedly left to being extraordinarily conservative until all the stuff happened with i think it was governor brown back a long time ago and then the, the economy bellied up so on and so forth so yeah media can be a very powerful thing and it's amazing how fast it can change but yeah if you want to check out that documentary i think it's called what the heck happened to kansas you know but it goes over a lot of things that and how it changed over a short period of time but yeah, media is crazy. Oh, thank you for the greetings from Brazil, and thank you for joining the stream, Adonis. I hope I said that right, and I apologize if I didn't. So, anywho, <coughs> real life politics aside, let's get back to our fictional politics, shall we? Okay, now that we've dealt with the news, Let's go ahead and vote on this campaign finance bill. Sign or veto the electoral campaign finance bill. The Grand National Assembly of the Republic of Swordland at the first session begun and held at the city of Holsword, blah, 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 blah. I can't see that. But um, electoral campaign finance bill. The criteria for the allocation of public funds shall no longer be according to the, to the number of votes won in the general election by a political party. The new criteria shall be the proportion of the seats won by a political party in the assembly. Political parties shall receive an annual amount of 500,000 rin per member of assembly. This, result in, this results in a doubling of the USP election budget and a slight increase in the other parties in the assembly while effectively removing all funding from the parties that are below the 10% election threshold. So again, if you want to try and keep those lower parties down, then you would definitely pass this bill. I am going to veto veto this. This is also one of the things that changed from the demo because I kind of initially got confused about this when I first saw it. So I voted for it and then the radical was pissed and everything else was bad. But they there's a little explanation now for these bills. So I really do appreciate that. Anywho, veto. And to give you an idea of also how that kind of works, it's similar here in the United States where I think you have to have over a certain amount of percentage in polling or a certain amount of signatures or a certain amount of votes to get um, spending money from the government if you're like an independent party or anything like that. But most parties, they go well below 1%. So it never becomes an issue. Anywho, veto. All right, we have immediate reactions as well. We Let's go ahead and read the report from Holsword first. The Reform Committee reports that any potential change to the Constitution in the direction of the reformists will likely result in the strong opposition from the National Front Party. The members of Assembly in support of such direction seems, seem to be in great numbers and possibly make up a majority in the Grand National Assembly, while most members of the United Swordland Party seem reluctant about supporting such changes. Okay, so we're going to have to worry about the... National Front Party. We'll deal with them. But at this time, strong men can gain a lot of power, so we're going to have to be careful. Now let's look at the reactions from that. The whole sort posts. The president vetoes bill. The campaign finance bill has been vetoed by President Rain after its approval from the Grand National Assembly by majority vote on Friday following a three-hour debate. Friends Richter, who also objected to the funding package, saying it contained too much unfairness in the allocation of the budget, also sought to delay proceedings by demanding a formal recorded vote, but was overruled. The bill passed the assembly, but failed to become law by President Rain's decision. So hopefully that can be shown as a gesture of goodwill and, you know, he can help me out later on. Yeah, that's another thing about the news sources, too, is like you'll see like even the name of certain things can be very politically charged, even though the article in, in and of itself can be very different. I remember that that came up here recently where um, there was a thing that was trending on Facebook. I can't remember. I mean, on Twitter, I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was like um, so 54 percent. And there was a there was an article on the Hill that basically said that. 50 some odd percent of people that um, that voted in the election or whatever were in favor of no 
yeah, it was something like 50 something percent of people were in favor of the president, you know, of course, uh, going on with the um, the recounts of certain things and stuff like that. However, if you actually look at the polling, that's not what it said at all. What it said was that 30 something percent of the people were strongly in favor of him conceding um, a certain amount, like 20 something percent were in favor of him conceding after certain things happened. But only 12 percent of the people that actually participated um, believe that he should not concede no matter what. So it just goes to show you that even technically the article wasn't wrong, but even still, it can be very it can be very politically charged. So you have to be careful with certain things like that. But news media does it all the time. You have to be careful. You got to check your sources and get multiple sources for certain things, which is why the games give you multiple multiple choices. So even the whole sword post, which is a neutral, can still be a problem. And to the radical. <coughs> Unfair campaign finance bill crush. But you would expect this from the radical. A new bill that further expands on the unfairness of our election system has been approved by the Grand National Assembly and was later vetoed by, the pre by President Rain. Rain deserves credit for crushing the undemocratic proposal, even though it came from his own party and would have benefited himself. The bill sought to change the rules of eligibility of the public funds that are reserved for every political party in Swordland. It eliminates every party from eligibility to the, to the funds apart from the three that are currently in the assembly. The insane proposal would have, would have also resulted in the governing United Swordland Party's share from the funds to increase double. Luckily, President Rain showed us that he can go against his own party when it needs to be done. That, that bill also kind of reminds me, um, one of my, um, my old supervisor from my job, he's from Nigeria, and he mentioned about how much the assembly members and the senators and the governors make. They make an insane amount of money. They make the United States look like, you know, look like civil servants, like actual civil servants. What's up, Michael Cunningham? Thanks for coming. But um, yeah, like I think they make something like eight million. I think it's like eight million dollars or something like that. But they also get money for every single post that they had before. So if they were a civil servant in their local area, they get a they get a pension for that. They get a pension for being a governor. They get a pension for being a former senator. They get a pension for being, you know, everything else. So they end up getting hundreds of millions, if not billions of Nigerian dollars and it's insane. So it's crazy just how, you know, how insane certain, you know, staff members and stuff like that or certain politicians make, it's crazy. Oh yeah, I'm, I definitely have my eye on my chief strategist. And honestly, I even have my eye on the um, vice president because I played through a little bit more of this game on the channel or at least for the channel. And some of the stuff I see about Peter is questionable. He's definitely going through some internal things. So if you're asking me, I honestly think that later on, you're probably going to see a situation where Peter is going to end up doing something unsavory and you're going to have to remove him. And then at that point, you might have to turn around and end up, um, you know, replacing him with somebody else. Who knows? Maybe even friends Richter or something like that. But we'll see. Or who knows? Maybe you end up in your own impeachment trial. <laughs> All right. Now that we have dealt with that, let's go ahead and deal with the mega project. A decision to invest in one of two planned mega infrastructure projects. The Ministry of Economy has put forward two bold plans for mega infrastructure projects that would help with the economic recession in the long term. Investing in projects of this scale will take up some portion of our budget, but could prove worthwhile if accomplished successfully. You can you can choose to not invest in it if you want to. You can just choose to just keep the money and maybe save it for later. Who knows? Something might come up. But remember, it does come from your budget. Now, I haven't got further on, far, enough, far enough in the game to see whether or not this causes a... Uh, if you can go into a negative. I haven't got that far into the game yet. But, you know, we'll see. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be consequences if you do run a negative. So we're going to, but we are going to invest in a mega infrastructure project.
All right. Yeah, you can choose to kind of screw, um, you can choose to screw the previous president over, which is what I did in my other playthrough. So, and I'm pretty sure that might come up at some point too. But at the same time, I don't think it'll be that big of a problem because I think Ewald Alfonso, it's not very popular anyway. So I'm not worried about him in that playthrough. But again, who knows? Maybe it will become a major problem at some point. We'll see. All right, so let us see what we have here. Now we get to discuss the potential projects. The view towards the Markian Sea from the Chaven was nothing short of exquisite. The seaside state resident fittingly named the Blue Mansion was large, fine, and accommodating. When enjoying the luxurious mansion wasn't the main reason of our visit, we gathered the economic team here to discuss the new infrastructure investment project. Half an hour had already passed since the start of the meeting. Unfortunately, I did not even have the chance to have my usual afternoon coffee. Oof, I don't think I could have coffee in the afternoon, maybe in the morning. Looking at the view from the windows, I let my mind uh, I let my mind drift for a couple of seconds. Simon's voice brought me back into the ongoing discussion. Mr. President, we need to focus on boosting the economy as quickly as possible. One of the fastest ways to achieve this is through infrastructure projects. Let's see, what can we focus on? There have been a lot of little things that have changed. So like for instance, I think before you had to choose an infrastructure project, you can choose to not even have an infrastructure project if you want to. Um, also, um, the corporations, um, you can turn around and well, I think as far as choosing the corporations, that's pretty much the same. There's some budget stuff in there as well, but uh, and also there's gonna be some impact on, on those things later on, which you'll see. But yeah, there's, there's been some changes to this, a lot of little changes, So, and I'm pretty sure those are little changes that are gonna have big impacts later on. And there's been a lot more dialogue added. There's been some other news events added. There's gonna be some investment opportunities that's gonna be added, which I'm pretty sure is gonna get you in trouble at some point in time later on. There's been a lot of things added. So what can we focus on? On the one hand, businessmen are complaining about the slow logistical rail network between Hosord and Lechaven. <laughs> Lilia started talking as soon as Simon took a breath. On the other hand, citizens are criticizing the lack of proper highway connections between Lechaven and Arvory. The narrow roads by the seaside are not only dangerous, but are also difficult to traverse. We need to, let's see, we need to heed the cause of the businesses in these days of recession. We're not going for that because that's not the playthrough that we're doing here. Uh, let me see, we need to pick the most profitable option for the economy. We're also not doing that because that would probably be, well, that's up to you really to decide. The citizens and their demands matter the most. Their demands are just. The dire situation of the road infrastructure between La Chaven and Arvory can't be neglected. Now, I'm not going to lie. I actually am a little bit worried about doing this because with us having issues with um, Rumberg in the north, I kind of wonder if they invade, is that going to make it kind of like easy access uh, for them to just kind of, you know, run roughshod over our country if we've just built up the roads and they can just go and walk all over us? But, you know, we'll see. But I could say the same thing about the infrastructure, um, the railway project too, because they could turn around and attack the railway project and then they blow that up, then we've lost you know, connection between two of our most economically valuable cities and that could be a huge problem. But you know, again, we'll see later on. <coughs> the return on investment will be low. Our concern should be economic growth. It is not the business people that suffer, but the ordinary folk. It also could, and that's another thing that I that I kind of thought about too, is that it would help us easily get supplies there because we can just turn around and use our roads and stuff like that. So we can help out our allies a bit quicker. So, but you know, again, we'll see. I'm not sure how everything is gonna play out. 
What really matters though is that we can accomplish something tangible in our first economic act. Uh, in this particular playthrough on the stream, I'm going to actually be more uh, just trying to be more independent. So I'm just going to try and stay out of the, the issues or whatever. I'm going to try and work with both sides when I can, not tick anybody off too much. And, um, and I'm going to be more diplomatic with certain things. So now on my YouTube channel, I'm uploading and it'll be out in about a minute, actually. <laughs> but... Um, on my YouTube channel, I'll be playing the authoritarian right, so I'm going to be far more into the military. I'm going to try and I've already closed the embassy with Roomberg. So that's one of the things that's going to come up is that you can decide to do diplomatic relations with Roomberg. I closed the embassy. I said, screw you. I didn't want to do, do any type of politics with you at all. So that's kind of what I'm going through on that. And I'm going to see if I can try and, you know, take advantage of some of the other regions like Wayland, for instance. Wayland has a lot of problems. And they do have a very bad person as a leader, but I want to take advantage of that for my own country. So, you know, just some things that you can choose. You can choose to be as much of a jerk as possible. I even ticked off one of my cabinet members so bad they left a meeting early and I'm pretty sure she's going to kill me at some point. So things can go left real quick. So it just goes to show you that this game has a lot of replay value in it, and I'm going to be playing this over and over again. So unfortunately, I had to delete that save. Uh, for the stream, but I'll be going through that later on this weekend and I'll be getting back to that point and I'll be continuing that playthrough. I already have five videos that I have over the next uh, four days or so. So, <coughs> Oh, excuse me. We must prove our administrative capabilities. The people must know that this administration can get things done. I agree. I did finish Lakeview Cabin too. I'm just waiting for the next update to come out, and when it comes out, I will definitely tackle that. So, therefore, I define two important projects for your attention: the H3 Highway Project and the L1 High Speed Railway Project. Mr. Hole repositioned himself on the chair to take a more comfortable posture. The ministry can only support one project at a time. With the current capacity and budget, let's move on to the details of each. So which one do you want to hear about first? Uh, let's hear about the H3 Highway Project, which is what I'm going to actually be doing here. The H3 Highway, I mean, the H3 Project aims to improve the abysmal state of the road network in the Anglin region bordering Agnolia. The area is home to several million Angno sorters and sorters who feel neglected. There are no proper highway connections to and from Anglin. The mayor of Arvory, Eric Neal, has been asking for a bigger budget to develop the region the to develop the regional infrastructure. He told us that even trucks are having a hard time traveling through the main roads. The increased traffic is causing trouble for people commuting in and out of the region. Sunslayer, I'm glad that you are very excited to play the game. It is a great game. I've been playing, I think I've played about 15 hours of it thus far, and it is a blast. And I can't wait to go back through it and choose different decisions and stuff. It was, it's, I actually mentioned this to the developer, the developers the other day, that one of the things I actually kind of hated is that I kind of shoehorned myself into uh, certain particular playthroughs instead of just, you know, having the choices that I want to choose or whatever, personally or whatever. So, but uh, I can't wait to just get it, get my hands on it and just play it as much as possible in my own spare time. So I'm definitely going to be playing it a lot over the next com coming days. All right. I'm not worried about fulfilling a quest for a party member. This is about the citizens of this country. Let's see. Oh yeah, I, I don't I don't trust anybody. Like even even um even the um what's his name? Even Franz Richter. Because you'll see that there's an interesting connection with Franz Richter in one of these corporations that 
is involved with the uh, with the project that you can choose here. So you definitely have to be careful, but I'll get into that later on. So let's see. That must be cumbersome for the citizens. Ooh, excuse me. It is, bless their souls. I'm happy we're thinking alike on the matter. Let us look at the map. I look at the map, Lilius was pointing at Lechaven. The H3 highway route starts at here and leads to Linkirk. So it's gonna start from here, then it's gonna go down to here. Okay, from there it goes all the way to Arvory. Oh, I'm sorry, it starts from the Chaven, goes to Linkirk, and then it goes up to Arvory. So this connects one of our major ports. So this just basically directs, instead of directing everything from the capital, it directs everything in the more rural area. So that helps out a lot. So I can I can see the benefit of that. From there, it goes all the way to Arbury. As a result, the road network towards the Agnolian capital, Stallport, will improve substantially. She paused and leaned forward in her chair. I saw the central government continuously neglect the agno sordish dominated regions when I was mayor. Is this administration going to continue that kind of negligence? All right, you're being a little forceful there, but all right. Let's see. We should no longer neglect the key region for our trade with Ag Agnolia. And I do apologize if I'm butchering the, 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 pronunciation, the pronunciation of some of these names and, and words and stuff, so... I apologize. Yeah, sure, but most goods flow to Lechaven and Hulsor, which give importance to logistics there. It has to be pointed out that the highway would be less beneficial in the near term. I have to disagree. It will increase the speed of transportation throughout the region. Our citizens will be quite pleased if we successfully accomplish this. Besides, if we enter trade talks with, Ag with Agnolia, they would see the investment as a positive sign. Okay. Now we'll go ahead and listen to the other, you know, choice or whatever. This is the choice that I chose in my authoritarian right playthrough. This is very interesting, but could you tell me about the railway project? Your predecessor, Alfonso, has failed in delivering this campaign promise, but we can start the construction of this groundbreaking railway project. As you know, our current trains can cannot meet the standards of today. As many other countries adopt this new electric engine technology to power up their trains, we fall one step behind. Reports about the newest trains in United Cantana traveling at incredible speeds has piqued the, the business interest. They too want to, to transport resources and materials from Holsor to Lechaven with great speed and efficiency. Okay. Major cities of Sorland needs more infrastructure to support their growth. Um, I'm not fully convinced yet. I, I'm not going to agree with this plan at all. But yeah, I'm not fully convinced yet. So tell me more. Our plan is to upgrade the old L1 line from Hosor to Lechaven. It will transform to a high-speed rail. Now, the one big benefit I can see from this is the, is the technological aspect of it. But I'm hoping I can still get that technology from working with a certain corporation that I do have reservations about. We'll see. Look at the map. All right, I look at the map. Gus was pointing at Hosor while Simon was looking attentively. I looked at the map. Let's see. The plan of construction starts right here at the capital. It will go to Enrica first. So right here. And then connect to Gil's sword. So we'll connect here. And then I'm guessing it'll go up to La Chaven after that. After which it will reach La Chaven, our economic powerhouse. So either way, it's gonna connect to La Chaven. Yeah, 
You know, it's funny. I, I don't trust Peter because, and this is just the suspicion that I have, but Peter kind of comes off like he has a lot of personal issues going on. Like, I feel like he has a lot going on at home. There was also mention, and I don't remember this in my in my other playthrough, they mentioned about how apparently Peter might have fathered some children, um, some illegitimate children. So I'm pretty sure that's going to come up at some point in time. Um, also, the way he talks about my secretary, I didn't. it seemed kind of sleazy and stuff. That's probably going to come up at some time, too. And also, he seems like he's kind of an alcoholic, at least in my other playthrough. Now, I don't know. You know, maybe it's just me reading too much into it, but I don't trust Peter, honestly. And you will see that later on. <coughs> the L1 will significantly boost the economy on the newly linked cities and even the rural areas in between. The Chaven is our primary port, so the goods unloaded there will be transported to Holsort much faster. Investments in already developed regions make little sense. That's my opinion as a democratic left person um, in this playthrough, so we'll see how this goes. I completely agree. Our attention must be diverted to the needy. The H3 makes more sense. The mayor of Enrica, Curtin Less, also requested this project to be prioritized. Businessmen in the region will be very content, which increases investments and employment. Therefore, I will recommend the L1 High Speed Rail Project. I've settled on a decision. Excellent. What will your final choice be, Mr. President? I've decided on the H3 Highway Project to improve the infrastructure in our poorer regions. Thank God. I knew that you would see reason. The negotiations will begin in the middle of this year. You'll be able to award the contract to a corporation of your choice. The ministry estimates that the entire construction will finish in two years if every step going forward is executed successfully. All right, thank you all for your contributions and thoughts. Have a good day. See you soon, Mr. Rain. Have a nice, nice day, Mr. President. Evening settled on the beautiful coastline of Lechaven. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the political situation in this country is really bad, and it only gets worse and worse and worse. I think the only real benefit that I can turn around and see in this particular situation is that, like, at least in, in, in Rain's case... He has a majority in the ruling assembly and he has a lot of power as president. Now he has a lot of forces that he has to go up with, uh, go up against, but he does have a lot of power that he can initially work, you know, that he can use in order to, you know, enact change or even just maintain power. So that's kind of the good thing. I like here in the United States where, you know, we have a divided government and it's going to be like that for a long time. So it's a lot harder for certain things to go through. I mean, and plus the problems just aren't that bad in general though. So but yeah, as bad as this situation is, I am hopeful, not in my other playthrough, but I am hopeful that we can actually get some things done because he has a lot of power. All right, so this is one of the things that was different from the demo. This was not an option, but this also deals with your personal wealth. Invest in Arcasian company stocks. Now, if you remember, the whole issue came up before there was a news article about Armadine Industries and their investments in um, their, they have a new pocket radio that's coming out. And that's going to be a thing. So a personal investment opportunity has been relayed by Mr. Manger, an experienced stockbroker in Ventry City, Arcasia, is selling valuable shares of Armadine Industries, an up and coming electronics manufacturing company. We could invest or let the opportunity pass. Now, I was actually going to take this, but I decided not, I'm thinking I'm going to go ahead and decide not to in this particular case. And the reason why is because we're going to be going up against Swordland today. If I turn around and choose the corporation that I want to choose, and then I turn around and take these stocks as well, I'm pretty sure Swordland today is going to be like, oh, well, look at how corrupt this uh, this president is going to be or whatever, because he's working with Arcasia or RAR. So I'm going to choose to not go ahead and deal with that. I'm just gonna go ahead and not invest in it as much as it pains me 
but I'm going to stay away from it. Yeah, and that's also the reason why I want to work with the reformists. So hopefully by working with the reformists and some of the, the reformists in my own party, I can consolidate enough power to maintain my own power. But again, you know, we'll see how it goes. I, I, I have a very tight rope that I'm walking and hopefully I can. But it, and also at the same time, I hope that they can turn around and see that while I may not give them everything they want and everything they like, if they turn around and go against me and I'm very popular, they risk losing their own power at the same time too, because the PFJP has, they've, they've gained a lot of, a lot of headway. So I could see a situation where if they turn around and screw me over, well, I could just go ahead and just, you know, go straight nuclear and salt the earth and then turn around and make it so where they lose their election and then the PFJP get their, get power in the next upcoming election. There's a lot of things that can, you know, happen, but We'll see how it goes. We'll see how everything plays out. All right, now we have the reception at the inaugural ball. But before we do that, I'm gonna take a quick break so I can go ahead and get some juice real quick and I will be right back. So in the meantime, you can just enjoy the sweet sounds of Swordland and Suzerain.
All right, everybody. Sorry about that delay there. Okay. My throat was slightly parched, so I had to turn around and go ahead and get something to drink. Yeah, that was one of the things I was kind of thinking about. Like, I, I hope there's a situation where I could turn around and just, you know, betray and join the PFJP if I'm more of a Democratic left-leaning president. You know, who knows? We might be able to see something like that. But we'll see. We will see. We will see indeed. Okay. Time to go to our inaugural ball. <coughs> I had just finished buttoning up my suit jacket when the doorbell rang. The presidential guard has had arrived to pick us up for the inaugural ball. The ball was a three decade old tradition, breathlessly anticipated by politicians, bureaucrats, and the press. All eyes were about to be on me. Is everything okay? said my voice is duplicated oh okay all right yeah sometimes things are a little bit wonky because i have to switch between screens so yeah that's probably the reason why that's happening i called on monica to get the children ready looking in the mirror i straightened my tie and took a deep breath after tonight there would be no turning back Suddenly, Dana hugged me from behind, startling me a little. Monica had fixed her hair into an elaborate braid, woven through with ribbons. Papa, Mama told me it's time to go. Hello, darling. I'm ready. Where's your brother? I think Frank is still upstairs. She shrugged. It was almost time to leave. The big ball was starting in less than an hour. Uh, let me see. Now, where's my first lady? I'll try and be a charmer, not a jerk. Monica came down the stairs. She was wearing a simple yet elegant beige sheath dress and short heels. Her hair had been neatly pinned into a chignon. A chignon? Yeah, sure, chignon. Showing off the pearl earrings I had given her for our 15th anniversary. All those years she had stayed by my side. Now where we were about to begin the most challenging chapter in our lives yet. How do you do, Mr. President? Let me see. I will kiss her hand. Again, being all charming and stuff. She extended a gloved hand and raised it to my lips. <laughs> now, of course, I could just be like, now where the hell is Frank? Frank! Monica, my love, you look as gorgeous as the day we married. Now, there's that charm that got you elected. Frank trudged down the stairs. This thing itches. Frank tugged at the collar of his new tuxedo. He seemed ill at ease. Hmm. I'm glad to have you with us for this big night. Sure, Dad. I'm just dying to go. Papa, are these people going to be around us from now on? She pointed at the presidential guards at the door of the house. Yes, Sorlin most, most important family needs extra protection. I don't think your daughter would be okay if you said that. Um, let me see. Unfortunately, yes. They can't leave our side until my term ends. You'll get used to it. It's all right, baby. They're here to make sure nothing bad happens to your papa or his family. Monica held Dina's hand. Together, flanked by the guards, we walked out to the out the door. Halfway to the car, Frank stopped abruptly and turned towards me. Dad, do I really have to go? Couldn't I stay at home instead? 
Hmm. Let's see. I think before... What did I choose? I chose... Yeah, you'll love it, son. I'm sure there'll be plenty of pretty girls to dance with. That's what I chose in my last playthrough. I'm going to go with... I'm nervous myself, Frank. But I feel a lot more confident with my son by my side. Frank smiled reluctantly. Well, when you put it like that, sure, let's go. Who knows? Maybe that could be a thing where Frank can turn around and, you know, be the next leader. Or maybe even his daughter. Maybe even his daughter could turn around and maybe she'll be changed by the things that goes on in the country or by the changes that goes on in the country. And maybe that could be a suzerain too. Who knows? She could be the first female president. So... We'll see. I really do hope they do some follow-up with this, though, because there's so much lore here. I could just see so many games being a thing. Yeah, I figured it would be pretty affordable. So I'm, I'm assuming it's about 30, maybe 40 bucks or something like that. I, I'm pretty sure there's the presidential version, too. And I'm pretty sure, like, on Steam and stuff with all these sales going on, I'm pretty sure there's going to be like a ton of sales between now and December. So you can pick it up. The presidential guard showed us the way as red and blue lights flashed around us. Sergey, my driver, ushered, ushered us into our armored limousine. The motorcade started moving towards the palace. I gazed out the window, deep in thought. Anton, what are you thinking about? Hmm. With all that's been happening, I'm wondering if I made the right choice. I know you have a lot on your mind, but you deserve to relax tonight. <laughs> yeah, let me relax in all these politics. I'm pretty sure that's going to be great. Just remember, no matter what happens, the children and I will always be here for you. I'm going to help Papa fix everything. Frank rolled his eyes. I know you will, honey. This means a great deal to me. After what seemed like just a few minutes, the convoy slowed to a halt. Sergey rolled down the limousine's soundproof partition. We are here, sir. Hope you enjoyed the drive. I did, Sergey. Thank you. Always a pleasure to hear that. Sergey opened the door for me. The normally imposing palace was festooned with garish banners that nearly made it look cheerful. A line of shiny, luxury sedans stretched around it. Good luck out there, Mr. President. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. It's, it's going through a lot right now because of all the, the dialogue that I've been doing. But you can find my channel at Darren Augustus. So just search Darren Augustus. It's spelled like Darren from Game of Thrones. So it's D-A-E-R-O-N. But yeah, I'm on Twitch. I'm on YouTube and I'm on Facebook. So have fun. I also did playthroughs of this demo, uh, the demo for this game that came out months ago. And I'm doing a playthrough of it today with different alternate choices. I'm doing the authoritarian right on my actual channel. Whereas on the uh, this well on this live stream, I'll be doing the Democratic left. So and I might just go ahead and stream it over the next couple days, but we'll we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Because I still have to finish up my playthrough on my actual channel. So I might go back and just go ahead and finish that. Good luck out there, Mr. President. I'll see you on the trip home. I stepped out and immediately found myself surrounded by loud voices and camera flashes. Hordes of eager journalists thrust their portable microphones my way. All right, Mustache Samurai, thank you for joining the stream. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, there's a ton of different backstories they could do if they wanted to, so. My guards fended most of them off, but one woman managed to dodge them and corner me. I recognized the Swordish Broadcast Company logo on her press lanyard. Mr. President? Mr. President? 
Do you plan on working together with the opposition parties on the expected constitutional reforms? Now, this is also one of the things that changed from the demo. So in the demo, they asked a few questions, but not a whole lot of questions. Um, and most of it were pertaining to the same subject. But you'll see here, they're going to get a little bit more in-depth about certain things. And they're, of course, going to spin it. And you're going to see how they're going to spin it later on. You gotta love it. My, my administration will bring real change. This this night is for celebrating. I'm not going to talk about my policies now. Um, I'm going to say we're going to work with everybody. So, because that is true. Plus, I feel like if I say my administration will bring real change, then Sorlin today is probably going to be like, oh, well, they're not going to work with anybody. They're just going to do everything themselves. Rawr. We're going to work with everybody. Mr. Richter clarified that as long as you hold your promises of democratization, they will support you on these issues to, to the end. What do you think about this statement? I welcome it. This is a challenge for us all. And I think that's pretty much the right option right there. Let's see. I cannot see the Twitch screen, but I just heard the little chime. I do thank you for the follow. I really appreciate that. And that's the moment Sorlin today will try to make you look as a member of the opposition. No, as an enemy of opposition or both. Yeah, they, they, they're going to they're gonna spin everything every way they want to. So, again, Fox News. Got to love it. So, let me see. Because I think in my, in my authoritarian right playthrough, I said, honestly, I don't expect much from him. And they slandered the crap out of me. And I'm on their side. They just they just blackballed me. They did so much crap. It was it was crazy. But yeah, you gotta love it. They they love spinning things. One more question. One of your first acts as president was to veto a campaign finance law that would have deprived small parties of public funds while increasing those channeled to your own. Are we seeing the beginning of a more egalitarian administration? <laughs> I've had it with your questions. Guards, guards, drag this woman off, please. Um, <laughs> I just didn't want to cause too much of a stir on my first day. It's a very good optimistic way to tackle it. Um, yes, no political party deserves to be silenced. That's enough, ma'am, said one of my guards, arriving way too late while nudging the reporter away from me. A path through the crowd was now open, and we quickly and we quickly made our way to the entrance of the palace. At the same time, a dozen fireworks went off. You know, we really got to get some better guards. Again, I could not see that because of the way the stream is working now. But again, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. But yeah, in the United States, there's no way you could get that close to the president if you want to. Um, case in point, when the, and I think it was in April, the April 27th tornadoes that came through Alabama, um, they came through where I actually stayed at, at the time. And um, the president came and visited. Jesus Christ, there was so much security. Like, I, I remember I was asleep that day because I had to go to work and there was helicopters overhead and it woke me up, and next thing I know, I went outside. The Secret Service was walking up and down my neighborhood and everything else in between. And then um, the school that he went to and visited that had been hit by the tornado, um, they had every single police officer uh, within, I think, like, I think just about every single police officer in our county and in a couple of the other counties that work a lot with our county. And then they had the National Guard there on top of that, along with the Secret Service. But it was so many, it was so much security there. They even had snipers on top of the roof. So it was crazy just how much security that they had there. But you couldn't get anywhere near the president. There was even a city councilman that tried to walk over there. They immediately stopped him, sent him back over the, the um, security cordon or whatever. So, yeah, we need some better security. I would prefer that level of security there, not this rinky-dink security service that we have now. So... The entrance was decorated with beautiful ribbons in Sortland's colors of white, yellow, and maroon. A lush maroon carpet had been rolled down the stairs. We entered the lobby and joined the throngs of people making their way towards the ballroom. Behind me, I heard a familiar voice. 
There they are, the most beautiful family in Swordland. Uncle Peter. Hi, Uncle Peter. It's great to see you. You two are growing faster than I am getting wiser. Um, are have you gotten any wiser, Peter? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Maybe not. After all, I'm still sticking with you. Happy to see a familiar face. Peter, Evelyn. Peter's wife, Evelyn, approached us and shook our hands with a firmness that belied her delicate features. Congratulations, Anton. I have to say, the results were clear from clear to me from the beginning. Uh, let me see. There's a woman behind every successful man. Gotta butter up the missus. What a gentleman. Monica smiled at me. Monica, how are you? You barely said a word. I'm more than relieved to have the roller coaster ride over with. But of course, now the real work begins. Ah yes, managing the help, planning parties, daily trips to the salon to take to look your best for foreign dignitaries. Don't be so old fashioned, Evelyn. I plan to use my power as first lady to advance the position of women throughout Swordland. Equal rights for our sex are long overdue. When you say Anton, oh boy, this is another thing that wasn't in the demo. You didn't you didn't get asked about any of this stuff. It kind of was a, it was pretty straightforward, but it's obvious now that your wife and the vice president's wife are going to be getting involved in politics as well. I'm sure that's going to turn out great. Okay, I think in, in the uh, right wing playthrough that I had, I chose to say that's my wife. Never content to just be a pretty face. Yeah, I know. I was a jerk. But again, right wing playthrough on that one. And I'm also going for a more corrupt playthrough on that. So yeah, different strokes. Let me see. Oof. As long as you don't burn the roast. Am I right, Peter? That's a good way to mm, end up in a doghouse. Absolutely. We will work together to achieve that. Monica flashed me a smile. Dana suddenly jumped in between us and tugged on my sleeve. Papa, can we go? I want to see the ballroom. Uh, of course, darling. Let's not delay any longer. Let's move to the ballroom. We left the lobby and made our way towards the ballroom. Inside, we were yet again surrounded by a noisy crowd, but this time it was the politicians who sought to appease the new authority in Swordland. I spent the next few hours shaking hands, joining various conversations, some serious, some superficial, and making speeches. We finally settled down at our dinner table with the Vecturns as the band started playing some slow jazz tunes. Oof. That was tiring. Let's see. If I have to shake another hand again. Suddenly, a loud banging noise echoed from outside the ballroom, then another one, and another. The musicians stopped playing. Everyone in the room was looking around in confusion. Peter and I turned towards each other, realization dawning on both our faces. Fireworks? No, gunshots. As soon as Monica heard the word, she lunged from her seat. Shield Monica and the kids. It's our first priority. I threw myself on Monica, Dana, and Frank to shield them. Papa, what's happening? I knew it. We never should have gone. Chaos broke out as some guests flung themselves under the tables, and others ran towards the door, screaming. Dana burst into tears while Frank tried to comfort her hiding the fear in his own eyes. Three more gunshots rang out loudly. Mr. President, are you all right? Carl Gracer, head of the Swordish Police Force, was running towards us with three more police officers in decorated uniforms. They all had their guns drawn. As soon as he made it to us and saw that we were un unharmed, he let out a big sigh of relief. Thank God. Status, ooh, I went with status report before. What's up, a random guy? How you doing today? What the hell is going on? One second, Mr. President. He turned around quickly to his men. Check the perimeter, now. Paul, Jansen, follow my lead. We will bring them to the safe room. He now turned to Monica 
Evelyn and the children and spoke in a softer voice. Do not worry, the situation is now under control. Please follow me. We promptly followed Carl through the winding halls and corridors of the palace. His men still had their guns drawn, which did nothing to ease the tension. On the way, Peter made an attempt to break the silence. What a fucking night. It's not over yet. Carl turned to us with a serious face as we were about to round a corner. Quiet, please. Uh, I'm the president. I can kind of talk, you know, it's okay. Sorry, I talk when I get nervous. Peter, shut up. Carl flipped a switch from the wall and a panel opened, revealing a hidden staircase leading to a large reinforced door. Inside, a set of emergency lights flickered on. The safe room was comfortable and spacious, with expensive looking leather sofas. Small security monitors on the wall displayed grainy footage of each room in the palace. There was a boardroom and a pantry containing enough provisions to last us months. Monica and Evelyn sat the children down and started wiping their tears. Carl stepped away from us and made a few radio calls. When he was done, he returned to me and Peter. Uh, let's see. What a night. So what's the status? Carl's radio suddenly crackled to life. Every second felt like an eternity as he pressed his ear to the receiver. When it fell silent, he turned to us. Good news, we're not in any danger at the moment. The situation has been dealt with and the perimeter has been secured by the guards and the police. He glanced toward Monica, Evelyn, and the kids. If I may, sir. He gestured towards a more private corner of the room and started speaking more quietly. This is what we know so far. We've confirmed that two people were gunned down in front of the palace. The gunman is one of them, and we are sure that he was working alone. The attacker fired three shots at an MP, one to the head, two to the body, instantly killing him. Presidential guards at the palace immediately shot and killed the attacker. The gunman has not been identified yet and will require an investigation. The MP that was killed was identified as Bernard Sarkaz. This is huge, Anton. This will cause a lot of problems. A lot of problems. Peter pulled out two cigarettes and handed me one. He then turned to Evelyn. I could hear him trying to reassure her that everything was going to be all right. Monica was still trying to tend to Dana as Frank paced the room, mumbling that he should have stayed home. Let me go and comfort my family, because this is a tough time for them right now. I sat down beside my wife and children. We are safe. I'll make sure everything's going to be fine. We can't be sure of anything anymore, Anton. Thanks, love. I really appreciate the, the backup there. I lit my cigarette and took a deep drag. I was going to see this through and keep my family safe. At all costs. I crushed the cigarette on the ashtray. So, Bernard Sarkas was the person who was killed in what may be an assassination attempt. Bernard Sarkas is a sort of poet novelist, short story writer, and politician. He is acclaimed for his lyrical flow and was regarded to be the leader of the Swordish avant-garde. He, his early writings were heavily influenced by the social, cultural, and economic problems of his home city of Dare. His work earned him the description of a romantic communist. He joined the Red Youth during the Swordish Civil War and fled Swordland after the war was over. Surviving the purge of Tarkin's soul, he moved to United Cantana and studied sociology at the Communist University of Kyo. There, he was influenced by the artistic experiments of Cantanan poets who advocated futurism as well as the ideological vision of Malignev. Many of his works are, re are regarded as the greatest achievements of the Swordish literature and earn him many awards abroad. Because of his political views, his works have been banned in Swordland since 1930. In 1950, Bernard returned to, to Swordland following the departure of Tarquin's soul. 
He organized strikes against Sordis government's failure to include amnesty laws and started to become a popular figure in Sordis politics. He ran as an independent in the 1953 general elections and became the first communist to be elected to the Grand National Assembly of Swordland. So yeah, this is a pretty bad situation because I think he's basically the only communist. So, and he's a very well-known figure. So this is not only a tragedy, this is a huge problem. So let's see what the news says. Swordland today, oh great. Rain welcomes Richter's words. President Rain gave signals about a cooperation with Franz Richter of the PFJP ahead of the inauguration ball. Regarding the remarks of Richter about a possible cooperation to fix the current problems of Sordis political institutions, I welcome it. This is a problem of us all, said President Rain. Richter has long been vocal about his democratization plans, but maybe his demands for constitutional change might finally become a reality if President Rain leads a bill together with Richter's PFJP. Okay, MP shot, nation in shock. Sordland has been shocked by grave news today as an elected member of parliament has been shot dead in a suspected political assassination. Police sirens were heard around the clock today as the whole sword police force increased security measures around the capital. The fact that such a violent act happened at the heart of the capital during the new president's inauguration celebration has worried many citizens. The red youth has reported to have promised revenge. It seems like it has the potential to be a spark that would swirl Sortland into the political violence of the 1920s. Oh goody, this is going to be lovely. All right, see so what we got going on in Whole Sword here. All right, let us read the security report. Security measures at the Capitol have been heightened after the murder of Bernard Sarkas. The mayor of Whole Sword reports that everything is under control. Security around the Maroon Palace has been increased with the combined efforts of the whole sword police department and the presidential guard. Additionally, the entrance procedures to the palace are being revised with advice from security professionals. The police chief, Carl Gracer, reported that an investigation has been launched on the murder of Bernard Sarkas. Jesus. Situation room, Maroon Palace. The mood in the situation room was gloomy. Gee, I wonder why. <clears throat> My cabinet members were gathered to discuss the shooting outside the palace. Lily has presented the initial report. Elias, are, are you there? Okay. Ah. Lilius Graf. Bernard Sarkas was shot dead at 9.03 p.m. in front of the palace gates. He was an elected independent, independent member of assembly and, as you know, a famous communist. She spat the last word out with some distaste. The guards at the scene were 50 meters away and immediately took action by responding and killing the assailant who was identified as a member of the nationalist organization Young Swords. Now, if you watch my other playthrough um, of this, that's actually what my character is. He was a former member of the Young Swords, so it has some interesting connotations there. Implications, excuse me. The president and his family were unharmed Play, praise God. Let's see. But why Bernard Sarkas? He has always been an infamous figure. His poems had a large impact in the spread of communist ideas and sword in them. Many considered him a threat. Our investigators are suspecting a political assassination since the young swords have been threatening the communists for some time. This sets a dangerous atmosphere where the left versus right political violence of the 1920s might spark once again. A return to those days would be devastating. The coups are the reason why our country stagnated for a decade, though I'm pretty sure some other countries would love that. Nia Morgana, the Minister of Justice, sighed. The Red Youth has condemned the killing but didn't stop there. They promised revenge. This will in turn spark further aggression from the Young Swords. This whole cycle started because Bernard Sarkas has expressed his, expressed his views. We can't simply look away. Nia had always been one of the only members of the Justice Ministry truly deserving of the name. She had survived countless attacks on her character while fighting corruption within the Ministry, and rising to, the power had, rising to power had only compounded her sense of moral duty. Freedom of expression is part of our constitution. 
We can't have anyone, let alone an MP, shot for voicing different opinions. Okay, now you can choose to just fully agree with what she's saying, you know, for duty, honor, country, all that stuff. Or you can say the Melanievis ideology that the Red Youth promotes poses a threat to our country too. We should be cautious. Or you could just go ahead and blame the nationalists. The nationalist young swords have overstepped and they put and they should be put on under the loop for such extreme actions. Now, again, while I am on the democratic left and I am against this, I want everyone to have their opinions, their views, no matter how distasteful it is. And I hope it doesn't cause me my head or my seat, but I will say I fully agree. We should protect freedom of speech. Yeah, the right wing authoritarian gameplay, that's what I have on my channel. Our laws do, and for good reason, silencing voices only result in fear and stagnation inside society. We had that before and know very well how it was. I hear your concerns. Our police do their best to uphold the rights of our citizens. We will prevent such an act from happening again by making sure our security measures are reevaluated. Minister of, De of Defense, Isof Lankia, grunted in approval. He towered over the rest of us in full military uniform, his many war medals conspicuously on display. Also, if you remember, um, he was the person who reprimanded us in the beginning of the game when we turned around and let the refugees through. So that's going to have some implications later on as well. Agreed, ma'am. Our gender Marie will also help boost security in the rural areas where possible. There might be more to come. And as I've said too in, a, in several of my playthroughs, the United States doesn't have a gender Marie. Uh, it, uh, I know Spain has a gender Marie. I think Frane, uh, France has a uh, gender Marie. But the United States, we have SWAT teams for all the police forces and stuff like that. So we don't really have a need for a gender Marie. I guess you could say the closest thing to it is the National Guard. or But even still, like the National Guard can't do the things that a gender Marie does. So that's a lot of federal power. So we try as hard as we can not to have that much federal power concentrated. Unless you use it carefully. We should refrain from making the issue a political one from the start. It will only add fuel to the fire. You are right. We need to calm the situation. Our government is capable to maintain security. Our job will be to reduce tensions. Several police cars rushed past the Maroon Palace, and everyone went silent. Regardless, a full investigation on all involved parties is underway. We will find the subversives and punish them soon enough, Mr. President. I will do my best to help coordinate the administrative tasks. Justice will be served, and the rule of law will return to this country stronger than ever. Only if we stay vigilant as a country, we must think about the upcoming budget. Hmm. And this is also where you can make certain promises early, which again will have certain implications later on. Now, I chose to not do any funding of the police or anything like that, and I'm going to continue to have that kind of route go ahead. And we'll see how certain things go as far as the turmoil in this, con in this country. But I don't think the increase of police will help that. So, at least in this Democratic left playthrough. It's too soon to jump to conclusions. Reckless acts will have dire consequences. Agreed. We need to be patient until we have the full picture. Lucien took some notes after checking the latest newspapers and reports. It seems that the tensions between the communists and nationalists will escalate further. It will be very difficult to pass any meaningful change if there is chaos in this country. Let's see. We will make it through this and deliver our promises. Hell yes, President Rain. This will be it for today then. We will convene again soon. Thank you all and keep us updated. Yeah, I am kind of worried about that in my um in my right-wing playthrough that I gave so much 
credits to the military and I'm, and I'm I think in my budget the military is getting the money so I am a little worried about that maybe I should have well then again if I gave it to the police I think me and the justice minister are not on good terms right now so maybe it's a good thing that I didn't do that but you know we'll see how it goes all right we have a codex entry that has been updated Bernard Sarkas probably mentioning his death let's see what we got in the news Murder at the Palace. All right, breaking news. Bernard Sarkas, a prominent independent MP known for his communist romanticism, has been murdered leaving the Maroon Palace grounds after the inauguration ball of Anton Rain. Reports indicate a politically motivated assault by the far-right nationalists of the Young Swords. Shocking photographs have been leaked to the press showing blood-dripped stairs of the Maroon Palace. We heavily condemn this sort of political violence. This is the very cycle the president must break with reforms. Here, here. I intend to do it. All right, let's continue. And again, I want to thank everyone for joining this stream. I hope everybody is enjoying the content. And I also hope you purchase the game. It's a really good game, and it definitely has a lot of replay value to it. And see what choices you can make. As I said before, it came out a few hours ago. So definitely pick it up. All right. We have five news articles, a swath of reports to read. So, yeah. Let's get to it. <coughs> All right. The whole sword post. So it is politicians shot dead. A Swordish poet and politician who had spoken out about the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat was shot during the evening of Anton Rain's inauguration ball. Bernard Sarkas, a 53-year-old Swordish member of assembly, was shot a number of times by a gunman at the entrance of the Maroon Palace, who was identified to be a member of the Young Swords. Despite his radical views, Mr. Sarkas was elected to be an independent member of assembly in the 1953 election and sadly did not manage to live long enough to serve his duty. He was said to have repeatedly received threats from the Swordish nationalists, who viewed him as a traitor for promoting Malinievism in Swordland. Television footage showed the famous poet's body lying face down, draped with a white sheet, on the pavement in front of the gates of the Maroon Palace. Lilius Kraft, the interior minister, said she had assigned a group of leading ministry officials to lead the hunt for the killers. Once again, dark hands have chosen our country and spilled blood and whole sword to achieve their dark goals, she told a news conference. We are investigating all aspects of this crime. His funeral will be held tomorrow in his home city of Dare. The local pol the oh god, the local police have reported to have increased security measures for the ceremony and stand ready for a massive attendance. All right. Let's see what Swordland today says. Sorlin has two paths to the future, and this year is, a, is critical to decide which path we embark upon. Amid a recession, the lack of stability and security caused by the death of Bernard Sarkoz is an unacceptable reality. We need more jobs and a safe atmosphere if our country is supposed to grow and prosper. But how will we increase our employment and open new factories if there is blood flowing down the streets? Sorlin will never reach its goals as an advanced society. If we descend in a downward spiral of a splint in of a splintering of our nation, peace and prosperity now and forever. They haven't attacked me yet. I find that very odd. It also is very worrying. <laughs> and from the Lechaven Times, murder was a method of the past. The tension between the left and right extremists have increased in the country after the assassination of MP Bernard Sarkas. Protests of Malinievis groups quickly turned into riots around the country, recalling for a peaceful protest and dialogue instead of violence. After the attack that prompted the riots, a member of Young Swords assassination, assassinating a member of Assembly clearly shows that they are willing to use extreme actions, said Franz Richter in his speech in the Grand National Assembly. 
We live within these borders together, and therefore we all bear responsibility, a duty to live together with our differences. Richter's unifying message is something that we all should listen to in these times of danger of loss. The murder was a method of the past and it has tainted us, reminded us of who we were before and who we don't want to become in the future, said Richter, and stated that we as citizens of this nation all bear responsibility beyond ideologies, partisanship, or any other identity. Nice speech. And the radical. Of course, they're going to have a lovely, nice, long post because this is someone of their ideology. So they're definitely going to be very moved by this. <coughs> it is a sad moment for Swordland. We've lost a renowned poet who not only wrote about the struggles of the working class, but also acted on them. However, his decision to enter Swordish politics was met with a sick attack that ended his life. This was indeed intended as a message to all opposing voices in Swordland. We, the team here at the Radical, condemn this evil act of terror of the young swords, who we believe must be held accountable as a whole group. It is finally the time for the government to realize this organization as a terrorist threat and serve the justice that is due. Bernard Sarkas is always going to be in our hearts as a great swordish poet, as a revolutionary, as the leader of the swordish avant-garde, as a futurist, as a romantic, as a Melanievis, but beyond all, as a symbol of freedom of speech. He is now a man who was murdered for speaking his mind. This cannot remain as yet another political murder of the sad reality of Swordland. In fact, it is time to change this. It is time to speak up as people. The most beautiful sea hasn't been crossed yet, said the great poet, reminding us to always have hope, and we must strive to have hope and to make them a reality. It is the best way to honor his memory. Bernard Sarkas will be laid down in day or tomorrow. Any citizen who wants to pay respect is invited to attend. Alrighty. Again, a lovely article from The Radical. The Economist. They don't give a damn, they just care about the economy. The only way out of recession, bailing out the business, because you know that's the most important thing right now. Sorlin's economy has been displaying a downward trend over the past two years of Alfonso's presidency. If we want to prevent our country from declaring bankruptcy, we need a way out of this recession and we need it now. The economic downturn keeps hitting hard at the businesses which are struggling to stay afloat. It is clear that a helping hand from the government is required to control the situation. There's no other way apart from bailing out businesses to truly provide relief to the economy. This in turn should revitalize the economy by creating more employment opportunities and increasing production in Swordland. Unless they don't use the money for that, which could always happen. So, you know, we're not going to do that in this playthrough. We're going to give money to the people because hopefully they well, they need help in order to get out of their economic situations. The businesses are fine. I'm sure there won't be implications behind that. And I'm sure I won't be attacked behind that. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure once it, I'm going to go to the funeral, but I'm pretty sure they're going to make me look like a real bad guy. I can't wait. It's going to be great. All right. Reports are abound. Let's start from the north and proceed to south. <coughs> Horton critiques trade. The leader of Agnolia has diplomatically critiqued the imbalance of trade between our countries. Concerns were raised over how much more Sorlin profits from net trade in comparison to Agnolia. Prime Minister Martin Van Horten requests a fair reevaluation of the existing treaties and future negotiations. Not my problem right now. Deal with you later. I have a country that's on fire. Literally. Police overburden and estored. We've been receiving reports of a lack of equipment and staff from the police forces in estored. With the escalating violence in the city, the officers have been working 12-hour shifts to suppress the protests to no avail. The police commissioner of Estorid has requested reinforcements and extra supplies of tear gas from nearby city cities. Jesus. Police understaffed. Narble has reported that it is currently too understaffed to deal with the ongoing political violence. Due to the small size of the police force in the city, they have been working non-stop and a number of officers were sent to the hospital as a result of severe fatigue. 
Minister of the Interior Lilius Graf has been working with head of police Carl Grazer to address the issue. So yes, the police are underfunded. That's always great. Illegal KA-74s seized. A cache found with Roomberg made weapons include 46 KA-74s, 2,854 bullets, 12 handguns, 27 grenades, and bomb making equipment was found in the basement of an abandoned house in Erzurin. No suspect suspects have been detained yet. The investigation is ongoing to determine the origins of the equipment. Again, always great. Gotta love it. Young Sword's youth wing leader dead after terror attack and the violence continues. Local Young Sword's youth wing leader in Uzerin, Jack Torin, has claimed responsibility for the organized attack in the Blutish market that resulted in the death of seven. His base of operations has been raided and he was found dead inside with two bullet wounds to the back of the head. The scene was organized to make it look like a suicide. We were not able to get information about the location of other ringleaders connected to the terrorist attacks. So I kind of wonder if this is other countries starting to interfere and starting to do things behind the scenes. Surely they're not getting involved, surely. Smollett warns against traitors. The latest diplomatic message from the leader of Whalen warned us regarding a pathway from the mountains of, Ber of Bergia that allowed traitors of the state escaping to Swordland. President Victor Smolok has demanded that the border security uh, to be increased. He also sent his best wishes about handling the protests in Swordland. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Illegal firearms found in Communist Party office. The Ribery Police Department raided the local Communist Party office after alleged attacks organized by one of their members and found illegal firearms in the office. The building has been closed and 22 members of the Communist Party of Swordland have been detained. Weapons seized in Cultural Center. Local police forces report that a wardrobe full of heavy military equipment has been seized in a Young Swords Cultural Center in Jin. Regulars of the police denied having any knowledge about the weapons. The owners of the building have been detained along with 13 other people. The police captured 22 rifles and two machine guns. The equipment belonged to the Swordish Armed Forces, dated 1929, but kept in very good condition. Oh boy. And it keeps getting better. Communist Party leader suspected of bomb attack. At 11.48 a.m., an unattended bag in front of the NFP office in Volgen was destroyed by the police on suspicion of a bomb threat, which were then verified. Upon further investigation, the Communist Party leader of Volgen, Milt Hanu, has been arrested in connection to the incident. Again, it's just, it's, it's wonderful. Everything is going great right now. We're doing great. Reports of BFF activity in the Capitol. The chief of police, Carl Grazer, reports that two Blutish women with affiliation to the Blutish Freedom Front have been caught in whole sword before they could execute a terrorist attack at a crowded rally. Both women are listed as wanted criminals and enemies of the state. The arrested women have admitted their intention to attack the National Front Party's rally at Seoul Square when Kasaro Kibner gave his speech but rejected any connections to the BFF. Both claimed that they were acting alone. Police reports that the situation is under control and further investigations are underway. All right, so we have dinner with the family at home and a security briefing on the threats against Swordland. Let's go ahead and address our family, see how they're doing in this tragic time. After a long day at the palace, I was finally home. I thanked Sergei and walked through the front door, nodding at the two guards as I went by. Even as I turned the doorknob, I could hear Dana rushing down the stairs to greet me. I opened the door and there she was, standing in front of me with expectant eyes. Papa, you're home. There's my beautiful princess. I lifted Dana up and hugged her while trying to put the keys in the tray next to the, to the entrance. She was growing fast. Lifting her up was no longer as easy as it once was. Uh, how was school? Boring. I liked my old school better. I put her down and her expression turned serious. Papa, are the bad men gone? 
Hmm. Yes, your papa took care of everything. I'm trying to be a good dad. Okay, papa. Dana dashed down the hallway. Mama, papa's here. Monica appeared next to the kitchen door. She was wearing an apron and holding a spatula in her hand. Dana, what did I tell you? No running in the house. Yes, Mama. Monica approached me and kissed me on the cheek. A tantalizing smell wafted from the kitchen behind her. Hmm. How was your day, dear? I'm trying to at least be somewhat normal. Terrific. I finally got to do some grocery shopping, just like old times. And I'm making your favorite. You mean... Yes. Zvobli. Zvobli was a classic whole sort delicacy. A vegetable and creamy, cheese, creamy sheep cheese sandwiched between thin layers of dough. So this is also one of the things that changes too, depending upon the choices you make in the beginning. If you come from the Chaven, there's a different delicacy you get. And of course you got one here. And I'm assuming that you'll get one Again, if you choose to be from the low income side of things, nice little touches. It was absolutely my favorite dish, especially paired with kib with uh, cabbage, a potent unfiltered wine from Bergia. Again, I'm butchering all of this, I'm sure. Hmm, it's my lucky day. What's the occasion? No occasion. I just wanted to cheer everyone up a bit. Her smile faded and she lowered her voice so that Dana wouldn't hear. Especially after what happened at the ball. I'm worried, Anton, for you, for the children, and for the country. Dana suddenly appeared next to us. Mama? Yes, sweetheart? I'm hungry. We'll eat in just a minute. Will you help me set, up, set the table? Anton, can you tell Frank to come down for dinner? He's been sulking in his room all day. Monica started taking out the china while I headed upstairs to fetch my son. Loud rock and roll music echoed down the hallway from his room. I caught a faint hint of cigarette smoke. Open the door. I tried to open the door. The door was locked. Well, at least he's smart enough to lock the door. So that's always great. Uh, knock on the door. I'll try and be polite about it. There was no response. Knock on the door again. Come on now. There was still no response. Bang on the door. The stereo in Frank's room clicked off. All right, all right. He unlocked and opened the door. What do you want? Okay, so you're starting off on the wrong foot. See, that's a good way to end up in trouble. Turn those records up louder next time, won't you? I don't think the neighbors heard. Ha ha. Frank headed downstairs to the dining room and I followed after. The table was prepared and Monica was, was ladling food into the plates. Come on, have a seat. It won't be as tasty if it's cold. As we started eating, the room went quiet. Monica's cooking was as delicious as ever but I had the feeling that wasn't the reason nobody spoke. Monica was the first to break the silence. Say, did you know that they refurbished the grocery store? I don't know if you remember the owner. He's been there every day for the past 30 years. Can you imagine doing the same job for so long? What if you were president for 20 years, for example? Now, again, on my other playthrough, I plan on being president for life, so there's that. But in this playthrough, let's not do that, so. I don't want this country to suffer under another soul. Agreed. That must never happen again. Anyway, the grocer really is a nice person. He threw in some extra vegetables with my... Frank suddenly slammed his hand on the table, rattling the china. Monica, Dana, and I stared at him. So this is how it's going to be. We're just going to sit here like nothing happened. Dad, you could have been killed. Mom could have been killed. Any one of us could have died. Dana's lower lip started trembling. Monica put her hand on Frank's shoulder. Oh boy. Oh 
pent up teenage angst and also general fear and he has a right to feel that way and yet we are still alive for now but how long until this happens again frank got up from his seat frank let's talk about it sit down frank took his seat again scowling Do you think I would let us go down so easily? Frank smirked. No, but it's not up to you, is it? Just trust me. He sighed. Frank, listen to your father. If your father says we don't need to worry, then we don't need to worry. You have to trust him. Monica turned to me. We all have to trust each other. Things calmed down a bit at the table. We finished our food in silence. Frank got up first and retreated back to his room. Monica lifted Dana up and plopped her in front of the living room TV before returning to the table. She sat down across from me. Anton, he's still young. Oof, let's see. I know, but there's not, not much longer we can shield him from the ugliness of the world. He's scared, Anton, and frankly, he isn't the only one. I promise if there is truly, if there truly is any threat to this family, you will be the first to know. She got up, stood behind me, and massaged my shoulders for a moment before leaving me alone in the dining room. I sat alone at the table and drained my glass of cabbage. Had I been lying to Frank and Dana? Was the threat to my family truly over? Time would tell. Oof, so things get heavy. Things get heavy with the kids and the family. I also have four newspapers. Okay, let's see what we got going on here. Protests across Swordland. Protests erupted around Swordland after the, after the death of Bernard Sarkas. Jesus Christ, my mouth, I needed to work properly many of which started peaceful, but soon turned violent. Protesters with red youth flags were seen in most central cities around Swordland, carrying out violent riots and organizing protests that disrupted much vital services from being delivered to the Swordish people. Protesters held sit-ins, which were broken up by riot police with tear gas and water cannons in the region of Bergia, Anglin, and Gruny. Thousands of people poured into Republic Avenue in Lechaven and Seoul Square in Hosword in response to the Young Swords attack. Similar protests around Swordland soon turned into violent riots. Great stuff. Great stuff. Protests in Gruny. Protests are taking place throughout the Gruny region in response to the assassination of Bernard Sarkas. The protesters raised their concerns about the Young Swords, the increased cost of living, and inequality prevalent in the country. Large rallies have been organized in the city centers of Benfi and Boren. A large congregation of Red Youth members have organized sit-ins and protests amid a, at, aimed at hampering public transport in the city of Volgen, which brought the city to a standstill for a few hours before riot police came to disperse large groups of protesters at transportation nodes. All right. The Chaven Times. Political chaos. Oh boy, this is a nice, this is a nice long article here. Political violence has surrounded Swordland since yesterday. While officials from the police claim to have the situation under control, protests are turning into riots and violent attacks are occurring around the country. NFP and LUS call for protests. Kisaro Kibner of the National Front Party called a rally to condemn communist influence from United Cantana and called the violent protesters as traitors uh, to Sorland. These Melanievis are roaming in our streets and conducting violent attacks in disguise as peaceful protests. We can't let them exploit a man's murder, said Kibner in a press conference. On the other hand, the labor union of Sorland has gathered to condemn nationalist violence in Sorland. The protests gathered, gathered crowds of several thousands and agitators from both sides in Hosord and acts of vandalism occurred. Katarina Horton accused Kibner for provoking the public. Young Swords vandalized shop. 
A group of people with young swords flags have vandalized a dozen vandalized dozens of shops in the trade district of Anarika, specifically targeting the Blutish and Angno Swordish minorities. The shop owners who defended themselves were wounded in the attack. The local police broke the group's part. NFP office burned. A group of violent militants have assaulted the National Front Party headquarters in Morna and committed arson. Firefighters have been called to the scene where fires raged for hours on end. So several nearby houses burned to the ground before it was brought under control. Jesus. And I'm pretty sure the economist is very worried about all this stuff. The wrong economy. The government has made its decision to promote a planned economy, a decision which is based on flawed arguments of solonomics. The economists believed in the free market economy for a good reason. Now before anybody calls us an Arcasia sympath uh, calls us Arcasia sympathizers. We don't support the excessive form of capitalism in, in Arcasia. Uh, Arcasia is spreading around the world like in Lesbia. Our belief is that a balance can exist where the government can support the private sector with government money. Businesses could take the needed economic planning burden off the shoulder of the government. We disagree with a planned economy simply because you can't properly micromanage everything in a society where people need to be able to determine their own future. The shortest people don't deserve to be shackled, and it is sad to know that President Rain doesn't think the same way. So again, they have some problems with the things that we're doing, but again, we do plan on turning around and having a mixed market economy. This just, this initially, I need to go ahead and get control over some of these corporations and some of these uh, businesses. Maybe I can get control of uh, Heart of Sortland too. But yeah, we plan on getting a hold of certain things and then letting the economy kind of run its course after that, but not taking complete control. Don't want to have too much power concentrated like that. All right, security briefing on the threats against Swordland. I arrived in front of the doors leading to the Situation Room. Today's security briefing was arranged in two parts, starting with internal matters and moving on to external matters after a short break. The Minister of Interior, Lilius Graf, and the Minister of Justice and Law, Nia Morgna, would join us for the first part and the law enforcement, uh, the first part, the law enforcement briefing. For the second part, the Minister of Defense, Isaf Lankia, would join with a few high-ranking officials, including the Chief of the Armed Forces, Vulcan Kruger. I opened the door. Lucian, Nia, and Lilius rose from their seats. Sir, uh, please take your seats. Nice review roundup. <coughs> mm. Okay. Oh, you mean the um the speech at the funeral? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying there. Everyone in the room sat down except for Lucian. He put on his glasses and went through the documents in front of him. Shortly after, he raises his head to address the attendees. Mr. President, ladies, we will kick off today's meeting with the internal security briefing. I'm assuming everyone has already been over the agenda. We all have busy schedules, so without further ado, I will jump into our first topic. As we feared, the political atmosphere has worsened. The reports around the country indicate that tensions are rising as we feared. What is the status on the Bernard Sarkas investigation? I have received news this morning that the investigation into the murder of Bernard Sarkas has concluded. <laughs> All right, I'll finish up as soon as uh, we get to the end of the demo. <laughs> Yeah, I'll go ahead and continue streaming until we get to the end of where the demo ended. And then after that, I'll stop it right there and let everybody else enjoy the game. <laughs> I received news this morning that the investigation into the murder of, Ven of Bernard Sarkas has concluded. Great news. I'm eager to hear about the details. After further research and testimonies, we have confirmed the intention and also the events leading up to the shooting. A few days prior, members of the Red Youth initiated a violent attack 
on a young swords local leader in Jin. We believe the young swords then called for revenge, leading to the death of Mr. Shakas. Since he often spoke against the young swords and nationalist sentiments in the assembly, he was a big target, not to mention his radical communist views. Political violence needs to stop. I do agree with that. Yes, we've kept it at bay for so long, but it seems that there are now new, tar new triggers. Lilius handed over the report and pointed at a highlighted section in the document. The investigation revealed a very troubling fact. The funding sources of, of the Red Youth have a clear link to United Cantana. Of course, of course. What does this mean exactly? Well, this is proof that they're meddling in our affairs. Exactly. Several Red Youth members with ties to United Cantana have been detained, and the information attract, extracted from them points to a preparation for a communist uprising in Swordland. It isn't unusual for the superpowers to influence other nations, but I think this case is a little far-fetched. The left lacks popular support in Swordland. Mia Eagler lifted her hand. I motioned for her to speak. I went over the report in detail. It would be wrong to jump to conclusions about a clear foreign interference about clear foreign interference yet. United Cantana has humanitarian and cultural ties with many countries including Swordland. Hmm. I also don't want to jump to conclusions immediately. We shouldn't create a crisis with them. We don't know how any of this is going to play and pan out, so we do want to be careful. Nearly three decades ago, they funded General Ricard and tried to establish a communist dictatorship in our country. If it was not for Colonel Soule, we would have seen the real crisis. She took a sip from her glass of water and continued. Our police chief, Carl Grazer, has linked the funding channel to United Cantana Consulate in Benfi. As we all know, the enemies of Sorlin are many, but we also have threats inside the country. We need to remain vigilant. As the government, we have all the power to deal with any threats. Our country always had issues. This is part of our job. Um, yeah, we need to remain vigilant. Let's go with that. If we give up essential freedoms to purchase temporary security, we deserve neither freedoms nor security. I've heard that saying somewhere, and I can't think of where it actually came from. This is debatable, but yes, we know what more security and surveillance cost to this country under President Seoul. Let's not forget that President Seoul, God bless him, brought stability after a long period of bloodshed and chaos. But moving on. Our highest internal threats come from the estimated 20,000 strong Blutish Freedom Front led by the imprisoned Doolin Arge. They are, banned, they are a banned political organization, now a militant force that is trying to incite racial violence. Jesus. Are they supported by our Blutish citizens? To some extent, luckily they couldn't attract a wide audience of Blutes but they could potentially attract thousands if anti blutish sentiment spreads in Swordland again. Lilius pointed to page three in the report. Our intelligence intercepted two crates filled with weapons close to the Runeberg border. They were filled with military grade KA-74s. We expect that more have been smuggled in since a group of blutes were caught with these guns at a checkpoint not far away. Runeberg has been acting aggressively in the region for a long time. I'm not surprised that they would attempt to weaponize the Blutish people against us. This is worrying. Very worrying. Oof. Choices, choices, choices. Okay. We need to keep level... We need to stay level-headed with Runeberg. They're looking for a reason to take action. They will play dirty while we play nice. It is a battle we will lose. This is grave news, but we must be careful not to stroke to stoke the fires of anti blutish sentiment. What is the second most important threat? It is the gang violence that is threatening the Nargis and Anglin regions. Two prominent organized crime families are at war, and the potential for bloodshed is real. Why can't we just arrest them? Yeah. The primary reason is deception and corruption. They infiltrated several government offices and the police. That's how they can evade us. Jesus. Lilius, I trust that you can handle them? 
I'm doing my best, sir. Lilius Graf sighed deeply. I'll be honest with you. With our current capabilities, we may not be able to prevent the further arming of Separatists while maintaining order in Bergia, Nargis, and Anglin. If the law enforcement budget isn't an increase, I can't be fully responsible for what happens. Our police units are spread thin as is. Hmm. You will do your job whatever happens. Don't come to me with excuses, because I'm not increasing that budget. I'm sorry. Yeah, Swordland is strong. It's real strong. So, I mean, it's going to take a lot to kind of get, get it out of the country. But at the same time, perhaps we can still use some of the stuff that we have and use some of the powers that we have to try and at least get some change while we have it and then get rid of the powers. But, you know, we'll see how things go. But, yeah, it's it's really deep in this country and really deep in the people's mindset. My job is to keep you fully informed, and this is the reality. My experience and expertise in keeping our country safe from violent thugs can only go so far. I wish you would stop using the word thugs, Lilius. The real problem is corruption, which is fueling the gang violence, and it's very likely the reason why these weapons were smuggled in. A higher budget could help us end that. Valid points, corruption is the root of all evil, after all. We can look into corruption once the weapons have been found and the gangs have been beaten. Just like previous administrations, kicking the can down the road. This is what's destroying our institutions. I'm going to keep them moderately funded, but we'll see how certain things go. We, we got to see how this entire situation is going to pan out with, you know, Roomberg and everything. But, you know, we'll see. This is a new playthrough. This is a democratic left-leaning playthrough um, for the stream. However, on the channel, I'll be doing a authoritarian right playthrough. And um, also, in, um, I'll be going through other different playthroughs once I get through that one as well. But for this stream, I'm just doing a democratic left playthrough. <coughs> well, this concludes the topics for the internal portion. Thank you for the updates, Ms. Graff, Ms. Morgana. <laughs> Morgana. Thank you for the overview. Have a good day. Until next time. The two ministers left the room. We took a short break before continuing to the second part. Yes, indeed. The game is fully updated and released, and you can pick it up now. Um, actually, if I scroll down over here... Look at that. It's $11.99 as of right now. Or you can get the presidential edition for $16.98. So definitely pick it up. Upon invitation, Isof Lankia, along with three high-ranking officials from the Ministry of Defense, walked into the room. One of the men was none other than General Kruger, the chief of the armed forces. Isof made his way towards the table while the others stood by the door. Mr. President. Uh, let's begin. I, I brought General Kruger with me due to the escalation on our borders. General Kruger stepped forward and saluted. He had a strong jaw with sharp cheekbones. His tall stature, unif uniform, and medals combined with his deep and intense stare made him look threatening. He was in his 70s, yet he had had a bulky body that was a result of his commando training. Not only was he the second most decorated officer in Swordland, he was also the longest serving. I will salute him and show him the due respect that he is owed. He smiled at the gesture and bowed his head in respect. Isoff tapped his foot impatiently. He seemed uneasy with the presence of another high-ranking officer in the room. I'm pretty sure Lankia is going to be a problem later on down the road, especially considering some of the decisions that I want to have. Gentlemen, thanks for coming to this significant gathering. Let's begin. Isolf and Vulcan took their seats at the table while the rest of the officers stood by the door. Mr. President, the situation at the western and northern borders towards Rumberg is very intense. We are observing deployments of divisions close to, closer to our border. Rumberg has been acting increasingly expansionist in the past decades and also interfered in Agnolia. 
But now they have turned their sights on us. Yeah, I have to deal with them. Yeah, you have to deal with the military pretty cautiously in here because they do have a lot of power and sway as far as the politics goes. So I have to be careful. But it does seem like I can drive a bit of a wedge between uh, Ice Off Lankia and Kruger. So, but we'll see how certain things go. Uh, what is your current strategy? Patrolling close to the borders with our border force and keeping Army Reserves divisions near. It seems like they want to increase the pressure both externally and internally. Mr. President, if I may. Please, General. The picture is becoming clearer. The latest information from the interior about the weapons caches and now there is an active military buildup close to our borders. The entire situation was analyzed by our general staff and our prediction is a future territorial incursion by Roomberg. Hmm. I have complete trust in the general staff. I actually don't, but I'm not going to tell them that. <laughs> we will not let you down, Mr. President. The general staff is composed of the smartest military individuals. I require an increase in the military budget to enlist more soldiers. Only then we can stand against strong, stand strong against our enemies. The enlarged armed forces will hold them at bay and possibly hold me as well. Falcon is right. We do need an increase in the military budget to have a more capable force to face a regional power to defend Swordland. Two of our most talented officers are voicing a common opinion. That is an understatement. Times are changing and war is coming, Mr. President. Whether we like it or not, we must be prepared. During the election, you said nothing about focusing on our military. I ask you to reconsider and to increase the military budget. The future and safety of Swordland is in your hands. Hmm. As you said, times change, Isolf. We will see. A glimmer of hope was seen on Isolf's face. Our forces would crumble under a decrease, and Runeberg would be much more compelled to exploit our weaknesses. Our country hasn't fallen into, fallen to any invading force for 200 years. We cannot let it happen, Mr. President. We could also find regional allies like Volsland and Lesbia to deter Runeberg. There are several options on the table. These options should be considered. They could be considered, but why pander to others when we can solve these issues ourselves? We have no true friends outside these borders. Everyone fell silent when a soldier entered the room and let Isof Lankia know that a call had come through from the ministry. Excuse me, Mr. President. Isof left the room to answer. A few minutes later, he entered the room again. His expression had changed. Mr. President, there has been a has been Roombergian military activity close to the Narble border. I just spoke with the local commander. Oh, great. Vulcan, we should go to the ministry and get further updates from our branches. Understood. Raising military readiness is the first call of action. If there is truly an extraordinary attempt, we will relay it to you immediately and wait for further orders, Mr. President. Hmm... Your service is appreciated, gentlemen. I won't, I, I would probably like to do this, but I'm just gonna say my dear service is appreciated. I don't wanna antagonize them. Thank you, Mr. President. You shall be updated if the situation escalates. I don't want them turning their tanks towards me. Hail Swordland, oh great, hail. Yes, hail, please leave. You're kinda scary now. Rumberg was already testing us, and the reports from the interior indicates interference inside our borders. Communists, nationalists, bluish rebels, Rumberg expansionism, lions, tigers, bears. What was next? Sorlin has had always been a key piece in the chessboard of the global rivalry between Arcasia and United Cantana, but in the recent years, there was no such aggression from Rumberg. Not at these levels, at least. All it takes is one tiny spark to start the flames of war. The phone rang. Rumberg had decided to close their consulate in the Chaven. All right, so I'm gonna actually go ahead and stop it right there. I think that's enough for everybody right now. I think that's a good amount of information to have going in. And if you've played the demo before, you have seen that there have been a lot of changes from you know the demo compared to now and there's many choices that you have going forward like i said um one of the choices that i had 
um, after this was how to deal with the embassy closing. I chose to not close our embassy in retaliation. You can choose to close yours, or maybe you'll choose other options in the future. Same way with the military. There are certain options you can choose with that. As far as foreign policy goes, I chose to work with certain other nations as well. So there's a lot of decisions that you can make in this game, and it's going to have a big impact on things. So be careful, and I hope everyone has enjoyed the game. If you like this stream, I have more stuff like this on my channel. I'm going to be playing more political games in the future. I'm also going to be streaming this game more. Um, I also will probably stream this tomorrow as well. Maybe even the same playthrough if you like this. Maybe we can switch it up a bit. We'll see. But uh, yeah, if you want to see more content like this, you can check out my YouTube channel at Darren Augustus. I am on YouTube and I'm on Twitch. Also, if you just search Suzerain, Suzerain I'm pretty sure it'll come up. So there's that. But um, yeah, thank you for watching and I hope you have enjoyed the stream and I hope you have a lovely day. And I appreciate everyone watching. I appreciate Torpor Games for giving me the opportunity to play this game and the opportunity to play it on Steam for them and for everyone else as well. And I hope everyone enjoys the game. Have a good day and I'll see you in the next one. See you.